Welcome to the Great Bays Tennis Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Smith, episode 163, coming to you from Wintergreen Resort in Wintergreen, Virginia, sitting at the table with Vic Braden Chair, Andres Barbosa, our fact checker, based in Miami, sometimes Bogota. He recommended that we put Vic's chair here. That chair, actually, the back, not the chair itself, but the back comes from the Vic Braden Tennis College. At is well over 50 years old for sure. And we have a rule, no one sits in the chair. The master, Uncle Vic. Uh, today our guest is Paul Wardlaw. I'm gonna give him a call, uh, veteran tennis coach. I think those insiders certainly know him for Wardlaw Directionals. Definitely need to YouTube that, major contribution to tennis. He's the author of a book called Pressure Tennis. Within that, he certainly covers Wardlaw Direction. He's been a college coach for 25 years. Not every day you get to talk to a coach who's won national championships. Uh, developed all sorts of All-Americans. Kenyon College, University of Iowa, Brown. Uh, and he's currently at the University of Denver. There was just uh, a short period within his uh, 25 plus years where he was the athletic director and tennis director at uh, the Dublin School in New Hampshire. Many college coaches that we work with, uh, junior coaches, definitely uh, implement Paul's work. So it's going to be great to talk to Paul. I like the expression, I like to hear it from the horse's mouth. If you get on YouTube and look up Wardlaw Directionals, you have to scroll down a little bit before you get to hear Paul because there's many, many other people sharing uh, their thoughts and their use of uh, Wardlaw Directionals. Let me give him a call. Rocky Mountain High. Denver, Colorado. Superior telephone skills. Hey, Paul Wardlaw, good morning. Thanks for being part of the Great Base Tennis Podcast. Oh, well, appreciate the offer. Tell us about the weather in Denver, Colorado. Uh, well, if, if you've never been to Denver, most people are surprised that we get 310 days of sun. So it's a typical Denver day right now. The sun is out. A uh, little cooler in the morning, 55, and we'll be in the high 70s, low 80s today. Rode your bike to work? Uh, every day. Even in the winter? Uh, pretty much. Pretty much, uh, probably 50% in the winter. We uh, The average high in January and February is 50 degrees. So it's uh, it, it's all doable. And the snow lasts about two days, and then it uh, goes away until it comes back. But, um, well, yeah, easy, easy, li easy living in Denver. Being at Brown University for 14 years, uh, the weather in the Northeast is uh, not so good compared to Denver. No. You, you were spot on on that. It's, uh, uh, well, your your indoor courts are your main courts. Your outdoor courts are your backup. Uh, prior to calling, I said a few things about your background. You've been at Denver for uh, three years. Um, yeah, just just starting the third. With uh, yeah, we can get into the all the college tennis. So many years, twenty five plus. Um, let's. Uh, Many times we start at the beginning with someone's tennis story. But let's start with right away with uh, Wardlaw Directionals. Um, how did you uh, develop Wardlaw Directionals? Give us some background with that. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll jump right in. Well, I guess first, um, first to define it, I guess. Yeah, I guess. well, Directionals, well, it's an interesting story. So I'd been at Illinois Benedictine College in Chicago. That was my first job. And then did four years there, and, um, and it was it was a great foundational job in the sense that I was head men's tennis, head men's soccer, intramural director, facilities director, and taught in the philosophy department. So those were those were my five duties. And what what you learn in those jobs is pretty much how to do a little bit of everything. Uh, and then leaving Illinois Benedictine, went to Kenyon, and Kenyon I was head men's soccer. I'm sorry. Head women's soccer, head men's tennis, head women's tennis. And I, I thought I had died and gone to heaven because I only had three jobs instead of five. Hmm. But um, 
1990, we were at uh, Nationals at Trenton State was hosting it. This was for the women. And we had a rain delay, and uh, we had to go indoors. And they played indoors at Princeton one day, and uh, Trenton State had some indoor courts also. But I went to the Princeton bookstore and picked up a copy of uh, Chuck Creasy's Total Tennis Training, uh, the one with the blue cover. Yeah. And picked it up, bought it at 8 o'clock, got back to the hotel at 9, stayed up till 2 in the morning reading the book, uh, literally five hours plowing through it. And my takeaway from that book was two things. One was I know nothing about tennis. And... Two, the, the whole idea of, in Chuck's book, he talks about the whole idea of when to change direction, if you change direction. So often for Chuck, it was just don't change direction. And uh, and I'm, I'm pretty good at, at picking out ideas and playing around with it just to see, you know, well, does this make sense? And so I was playing with my assistant coach and serving in volley and served to the deuce court. And got a, what I call now, I got a forehand volley. I'm a righty. So I served, deuce, ball came back, and I didn't change direction, hit it back where it came from, and that made sense. Then the next time I got to the deuce, served and volleyed, got a ball to my backhand on the deuce. And, you know, in Chuck's book, it's hit that ball, no change of direction. And my body was telling me, no, your body is rotating on that volley, your body wants to change direction. So then kind of a light bulb went off. Well, you know, one of them made sense. One of them didn't make sense you know, with the shot selection. And, and and both were a function of how the body worked. So that's when it's kind of like if you play baseball, an inside pitch in baseball, you turn on it. Your body rotates and you turn on it. Uh, and that's basically the – where the, where the idea came of the inside and outside ground strokes. And just for your listeners who aren't familiar, an outside ball, let's say we're in a cross-court rally deuce, an outside ball is a ball that crosses your body. And an inside ball, if we're hitting deuce to deuce, let's say a ball comes through the middle, that's a ball that does not cross your body. And the difference would be on an outside ball, the high percentage shot and the way your body works from a rotational standpoint uh, is do not change direction of the ball. And then on the inside ball, your body rotates. It's a natural shot to change the direction of the ball. So with those two guidelines, we started playing around with them in, uh, let's say, 1992. And we had a player, Catherine Lane, out of Nashville. Beautiful strokes. Uh, not the best mover. Um, efficient but but not not really the fastest player on the court and so what we did is to maximize her court coverage and to keep her court closed we had her play with directionals and uh she was our number two player in the lineup she became an all-american that year and really hard to beat because of that and and that's kind of the, the beginning of directionals and um there's also you know at some point you want to hit the ball what we traditionally call going down the line um the idea there is try to try to keep the ball straight so what does that mean if i'm going to go line i want to hit the ball that would be parallel to the sideline or as it crosses the baseline at a 90 degree angle and we call those 90 degree changes of direction and, and the reason to call them a 90 is it's perpendicular to the baseline, but you want to change your reference point. Uh, the idea is we aim at what we see, and if we aim at the sideline, that's where we're going to hit the ball. If we make the baseline our reference point, and when we go 90, then the whole goal is to make the ball cross the baseline uh, at a 90-degree angle. So that's kind of the kind of the background on directionals. And um, uh, in some way, if you look at our success in Division Three. In the 90s, uh, we might have had a little bit of an unfair advantage tactically just because we were so organized with, with how we played. Uh, so, yeah, so that's that's kind of the kind of the backstory. And you won some national championships there. How many, how many, how many years um, were you at Kenny? You won three national titles, right? 
Yeah, I was there eight years. And so we had a group. When I got there, uh, Scott Tilkey was my predecessor. And Scott had done a great job. Um, so when I arrived there, we had four freshmen, uh, let's see, a couple of, I think a couple of sophomores, a junior. Um, so kept a young team. And that, that group, we went from 10th to 8th to 2nd to 1st. And, um, and really, let's see, probably the last two years we started using directionals. Um, but we were doing a lot of interesting things. I think if I look back at my career, kind of Kenyon was my laboratory. Um, we did a lot of interesting things that, uh, you know, people, people equate me with directionals, but we actually have a lot of, a lot of other interesting things that we do um, that I think made a, made a huge difference in our program. And uh, if you, the, the book Pressure Tennis, yeah, which came out in 2000, that's a practice system. And even, even a lot of my friends in uh, college coaching, they just assume that that's just a book about directional. And it was actually our whole, whole practice system that we used at, at Kenyon. And, a little more of a kind of a Dean Smith idea where we, we charted practices and uh, I had software developed where we were able to, uh, you could chart who who played in a drill against whom and who won the drill, what the score was. Um, so we had, we had all this data. And part of that came out of um, being a head coach of women's soccer in the fall. And then both tennis teams were highly nationally ranked and practice year round, I would go down to soccer practice and my assistant on the tennis side would chart all our practices. So I could come back up the hill, stop by practice, look at the clipboard, and you could tell who had you know what type of practice each of the players had based on how they did with the drills. Um, so we were pr- pretty organized in that aspect. And, uh, and also it, it was more of a, it's amazing how how much tennis has evolved tennis side coaching since the nineties. But you know, I think we were one of the first to do a lot of the games approach um, to tennis and use that in our college practices, um, but, but actually kept score. That's, that's more of a Dean Smith uh, idea in basketball. Anthony Dorrance and soccer was doing that. Um, Did and, you... and I think another, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, did you have players that played both soccer and tennis or not so much? I had two uh, that, that, did, that did other sports. Um, it was getting to be at that time, um, it was hard, you know, it, it was before the clubs took over youth sports, but it was still at a time, you had to be at a pretty high level, a decent level to play for us. So it tended to lend itself more to kids that had, had made a commitment to tennis earlier. But we did have a few that were uh, multi-sport. I, w- I was a multi-sport guy in college. I played soccer and tennis in college. And, um, I could ask you because you, you spent so much time coaching Division One tennis as well that uh, you could give a plug for Division Three, especially <laughs> boys. I have so many boys that should play D3 over the, over the years, mm-hmm. but they D1, D1, D1. Uh, when you give a shout out for D three sports, what comes to your mind? Well, I'm I'm a D three guy. I went to the College of Worcester and played soccer and tennis. Um, and one of the reasons to go there was to do both. But I, I think the balance uh, of D three and, and the level of play. I don't think people realize how good the level of play is in D three. And um, I think the tricky part is it's non scholarship. So often people equate the value uh, with the scholarship dollars. Uh, and that's a little more of an ego, a little bragging right than I'm, I'm on scholarship kind of thing. But I think the, and I think the coaching's gotten better um, in D3. There's a lot of good coaches. Um, back in the 90s, you had guys like Bob Hansen. Uh, you know, talk, talk to Bob Hansen about that. The guys that, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's been there and done that. And uh, there's just, it's a, it's a good good environment and a, and a really healthy balance of academics and, and education in, in uh, tennis. Bob Hansen, I think he's still working as a – didn't he step down as the head coach at Middlebury and he's, still, he's there working as an assistant? 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what where Bob is right now. But uh, there are a lot of a lot of good D3 coaches, a lot of good programs, a lot of you know these guys are serious. And yeah, I I love I love the D3 aspect, and that's one of the things. Uh, what I really like about Denver being here is we have such a, a healthy balance between the academics and the tennis. And we're able to you know, have a private school education, small, small private school, but uh, serious high level D1 tennis. So it's a, it's a pretty cool mix. Uh, and, and I think pretty unique uh, on the college scene, especially on, on division, division one. But, you know, I think most of my probably significant learning took place on the D3 level as a coach and, and partly because I had to do everything. Um, and I had to, you know, if you're, if you're serious about your craft and you're willing to learn, um, you've got to dig around uh, and you've got to, you've got to create. And I think that's one of the, the cool things about D3 that um, we don't have the resources that you have in D1, but in some ways that, that can be a good thing too. With uh, having won national titles, obviously there's a lot more to winning national titles than directionals. Um, mm-hmm. Want to ask more questions about uh, some of the other points in your book, Pressure Tennis? But uh, Dave Secker, he's a big fan of yours. He says that the first thing he does with the players at NC State, the women's team, is they watch uh, Word Law directionals. He has a question here for you: uh, Which pros, past mm-hmm. and present, are good examples of players playing smart tennis, smart choices with directionals? Mm-hmm. Well, when when I was playing around with directionals, um, how do you create buy-in? Because you know it's one of those things. Well, well, the players know me, so you know they're going to look at me and go, well, "What does this guy know about tennis?" Uh, other than you know what we do in practice and all that. So what I did is I I put together uh, clips of the pros playing, and that's how we introduced directionals. And at that time. Uh, kind of the role models, Sampras, Agassi, Chang, uh, those were kind of the big three. And and pretty much whenever I would watch tennis, everybody was doing it. In, in some ways, it's kind of the natural way to play. Um, I think I think players now are more willing to to play to the open court, but they do it in a smart way. They they do it. They keep the court closed. They're not going for the line so much they use the 90 degree change of direction but i was i was shocked when when i kind of came up with this idea and then started watching pro tennis how it was pretty universal and you can almost in some ways it it took a little bit of the art or randomness out of watching tennis because the patterns became pretty predictable paul what do you mean by keeping the court closed well if i I think a strategy that a lot of players have is, again, you aim at what you see. And if you and I, Steve, are in a cross-court rally, we're both righties, what do I see as the open court, which would be to to the ad court, going to a deuce court rally? And a lot of players just like to play to the open court. If I, from the deuce court, if I play to the open court and I don't hit a penetrating shot, I've now exposed my ad court. And so the idea is, and this is what we did with Catherine Lane, is she she held the angles, she kept her court closed by being very selective when she went, uh, changed direction on that outside ball. And um, and that's kind of, I think that's the art of the deal. Is, and, and I think the mistake a lot of people make is they look at directionals as rules. And uh, I think the initial publication is direction directional guidelines. And these are guidelines and you want to play to your player's strengths. And, but what they do, what it does is it gives them a, some clear patterns um, to use tactically. And, and what's really interesting too is if the player is playing the ball, they're not playing their opponent. And when you get into pressure situations, it allows you to focus on just the ball because that's what you're doing. Am I going to change the direction of the ball? And too often we focus so much on our opponent. And, you know, and there's obviously some, some strengths and weaknesses you'd want to play against. But the idea is, especially under pressure, is not having to think, letting your body do what it wants to do naturally, and just responding to the ball. Um, so a little, 
a lot, a lot of little hidden benefits. Uh, and it's one of those things, I had an assistant when we first did directionals. It took him six months to see it. And and, it's, and this guy's a smart guy, but we were one day, we were playing and we were working on it. And he's like, oh, I get it. And he finally saw it. So in some ways, with directionals, it's a little bit of a paradigm shift. It, it's something that you have to see to understand. And, and in some ways, it, it helps to experience it. But once you see it, it's just like the light bulb goes off and it's like, oh, this makes sense. It, so, it, uh, it does seem that, you know, junior tennis players are, you know, they see the open court and they say, that's where I have to hit my opponents in this corner. So I have to hit to the other corner. And I think also to beginning parents, like, why are you, you know, you know, why are you hitting it right back to the person um, mm-hmm. instead of, you know, hit it, make, make them always move. Um, I think that's a problem that people are, we're always telling people make it easy for yourself first and difficult for your opponents second. Mm-hmm. And yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's, it, what's nice about it is it, it applies in so many different areas. Um, so for instance, passing shots, um, kind of a, I probably shouldn't tell the, tell the neighborhood about this, but, uh, passing shots, no change of direction on a passing shot. And so then, I mean, how, how simple a concept is that? So rather than, hey, we're going to work on passing shots, well, hey, no change of direction on the passing shot. You've just mastered the passing shot. Yeah. And you think and you think about it, if somebody approaches line, they have to cover middle. They have to move to the middle if they're, if they're hitting, approaching down the line. And just hold the angle, hit the ball back where it came from. Now you're playing behind the player. Somebody approaches cross court, they have to cover line hit it back where it came from. Now you're playing behind them again. And then, then also too, with uh, changing the direction, <laughs> if you have, a f- exactly. which most players do have some flaws in their swing, it's more difficult to calculate it <laughs> when you're changing the direction. Exactly. Cause you're making contact at a, at a 90 degree angle to the ball. When people think of directions, yeah, I think they think often of ground strokes. <laughs> um, you mentioned passing shots. Um, this is another question. What about directionals with volleys? Could you talk talk yeah, about that for a minute? Yeah. No, I, I think it works well. I, uh, I, I remember listening to a podcast recently. Kelly Jones was talking about teaching the volley to college players, and he just basically says, "Well, just hit it cross court." You know, as you're learning how to be a volley or at the college level, and and that that would be simple directional. Outside volley, no change of direction. Inside volley, change direction. Uh, and get good at those two. And then the, the third or the second layer, the third layer would be to do a 90 degree change of direction with the volley. So, yeah, all, all these things apply. Uh, and when we work on the on transition and volleys, we usually break it down into those three areas. We'll do, we'll do a series of, let's say somebody's, a right-handed player doing a backhand down the line, um, ideally a 90-degree shot to the baseline, we'll then hit them. We'll do a whole series of inside volleys. And we'll do a series of outside volleys where they don't change direction. And we'll do a series of outside volleys where they go 90 degrees. And a lot of this is, one, making them aware of what their options are, limiting their options, keeping it pretty simple, uh, and then getting good at those three things. And um, uh, so that's the beauty of tennis. It's you know the old, the old kiss principle: keep it keep it uh, simple, stupid. Um, and yeah, it holds up with volley. With uh, I remember Dennis Vander used to always say, you know, keep the volley in front of you and hold the line. Um, I think Sampras was great at that. When the ball was below the level of the net, you know, he wouldn't take the volley to the open court; he'd go right back where it came from. Um, exactly. But I think when we t- when we say hold the line, I mean I think I think we'd be better off sometimes. You we should say hold the flight pattern. In other words, if the ball is below the level net, it came into you. Braden used to say, you know, crooked versus straight. If it comes in crooked, being cross court. Um, mm-hmm. I like what you said though. Is it's really it's not rules. It's more guidelines to take yeah. the ball back play, where it play came to, from. Play play to your strength. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, return of serves, uh, you see that in doubles a lot. Uh, if somebody on the deuce court 
they're a right-hander. They get a backhand, let's say the serve is backhand body, uh, or not necessarily body, but a little bit away from the body. The natural return is to go at the net play. And it was funny when I first we first started doing directionals, the natural play for the serving team would be serve to the backhand and then poach. And we would just turn on every inside ball. And um, so it, you know, it applies in a lot of different ways. It's a good base. And it gives you a common language with a team. So uh, it, it makes us, when we talk about tactics and practice and matches, um, it helps just to have that kind of a, a simple but common language that we use. What about your thoughts today with the, the number one pattern being where people are just say a righty, they're always moving to their left, hit forehands. It's not like yeah. people stay in the pocket and hit forehands and backhands. What are your thoughts yeah, te- te- teaching directionals with people just always looking to hit a forehand? Yeah, no, I mean, directionals, we had a, when it came out, it was players with a weapon. And, uh, and I, I like O'Shaughnessy's where he breaks the court down into four lanes. You've got a, the A and B lanes are half of the deuce court and the C and D are half of the, half of the uh, ad court. And so, you know, balls through, through C, which is, you know, the first lane in the ad court, players are playing with their forehand from there. And directionals apply well to that. Uh, you know, you hold the angle until you get a ball that, you know, you probably want to be inside the court, and then you, you turn on that inside ball. So you go inside out, inside out, and then turn on the inside ball. Or hold the, line, hold the angle, inside, inside, inside. Inside out, inside out, inside out. Uh, but yeah, for, yeah, for, uh, yeah, for the listeners like yourself, uh, <clears throat> making a major contribution to tennis, Craig O'Shaughnessy with the brain cool. game. If the listeners haven't mm-hmm. heard that name before, Craig O'Shaughnessy, brain game. That's how you so we'll, find him online. Yeah, yeah, and that's and, and he's got he's one of the first to do a lot of tennis analytics um, with the ATP statistics, WTA statistics, um, and, and great stuff. Um, so we use O'Shaughnessy's ABCD with with directionals. So um, a ball hit to, let's say you and I are in a deuce court rally. Uh, B is toward the middle of the deuce court. We call that we call that um, outside middle. And then if a ball hit, is hit to A, which is closer to the sideline. We call that an outside ball. So now we have a distinction between outside middle and outside. And where that has value is, uh, let's say return of serves. You're, you're serving to the deuce court, and it's a second serve, or even a first. Uh, probably one of the best returns is hard to the outside middle, which would be the B. And that's kind of a... It's like a trap ground stroke where the server a lot of times wants to go to the open court. And this is why. But um, but we'll we'll use a lot of these distinctions tactically. You know, if, if I was playing Djokovic in a in a match, I would try to avoid hitting to D, which is where his backhand is, um, because that now gives him line and it also gives him an opportunity to pull cross. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of tactical uh, ways of. One, again, having a common language, keeping it simple, but uh, also effective. You know, you said that the first job you had at Illinois um, was like a lab. We had a a lab at Tennis Tech, Tyler Junior College, and we have eight pillars, and we call our curriculum or our pathway great base. But certainly, um, there's many, many things, but uh, part of your language has become the language of the great base, and one is... uh, point in each situation. Could you talk about the three zones that you have? The build, uh, building, uh, the forcing, and the oh, point ending. Oh, the point building? Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, it's funny. You meet a lot of people in tennis. Uh, and a good friend of mine is Jeff Moore at Texas. And uh, I, in fact, I, I would probably riff more on what Jeff, Jeff's language than what I had in pressure tennis back in the, back in the 90s. But it's basically um, looking at the game. Uh, so you, you know, you're serving first serve. That's first strike. Uh, 
um, it's a first strike opportunity. And what you want to do, I'll, I'll give you the kind of the five different ones. So you have first strike, you have point building, you have capitalizing, you have finishing, and you have defense. And defense is actually pretty interesting. I can tell you more about that, some of the things that we're doing. But um, each of those areas, what's really important is the mindset. So when you step up to the line and you're in a first strike situation, what you the mindset has to be, I will strike first. And and that's a that's a key component because so often we don't think about the mindset. So when a player plays with a weapon and they're playing out at C and D with their forehand, if they don't have an aggressive mindset, they are going to expose the deuce court. So any you know anytime you play with a weapon, you've got to have the proper mindset. Um, so for point building, the mindset is I've served, the ball comes back and play, we're kind of in a neutral position. I'm trying to build the point so I can capitalize. And the mindset with point building is I will be as aggressive as possible, but not miss. It's a little bit of a negative. So I will be as aggressive as possible and make the ball. Um, and what are we aggressive with? It's not pace, it's racket head speed. So I want to be able to swing the racket, have the courage to swing the racket, high percentage, and try to create a ball that I can capitalize. And I think what's interesting with capitalizing, too often players, and the mindset with capitalizing is let's say I get a three-quarter court ball, I can be a little bit more aggressive. And I know this with our players, and we're, we're trying to kind of rein them in a little bit. A lot of times, players get a capitalizing ball three-quarter court. They think that's a finishing ball. And the secret to college tennis is winning points at the net. It's not finishing points from three-quarter court. And the higher level you go, the defense is better. The ball's coming back. So what you want to do in a capitalizing situation is create that finishing opportunity. And that's going to be inside the service box uh, with a volley, ideally, or something, or, or a fat, fat uh, sitter ground stroke. Um, but the mindset for capitalizing is I will capitalize, and then I will finish at the net. So, so that's, those are kind of the, I think the zones you were talking about. Yeah. No, I think it, it, it's a line <laughs> that we use on a daily basis. Uh, ideally, you're going to miss, and if you're going to miss, miss in a point in any situation. Mm-hmm. you know green zone four court you know it's, it's just great to talk to yourself a tennis mind I, um before the podcast started Mackenzie mcdonald's on tv and I, I have a note that was written by fetter shared with matt clore it's on my phone it said basically what dick gould said for years i don't care how you get there but you get there twice a game you know going about playing, <laughs> playing at the net mm-hmm. uh, what about yeah, pro, pro, go ahead go i'm sorry no, you go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say approach shots. Um, you know, I think that uh, people are a little bit stuck on always approach down the line. I think because when they're juniors and they're in a group setting, you know, you get two lines going and they weave off the court. I'm sure there's other reasons, uh, but it just it seems like that's almost avoided approach cross court. What are your th- some comments on approach shot patterns, directionals? Well, uh, yeah, directionals makes it pretty simple. So we did, we're actually working this week. Uh, uh, we've got five sophomores on our team. So last year, uh, we tried to establish, and you'll, you'll enjoy the pun, a great base for them to play out of. And uh, so we're, we're pretty solid out of the ground. The next, kind of really the next evolution for that group is winning points at the net. So how do we get there? And so one of the drills we did uh, this week was just, and it was cross court, cross court, uh, forehand, forehand, and then the one player on one side would feed an inside ball to the player. So uh, that player would then take the ball cross court, and the player who had fed the inside ball they have to slice the next ball uh, with their backhand. So these are so it's forehand to forehand, backhand pull cross court players on defense, slices it back. And what we're working on is as you open up the court, if a player is running and has to show slice, then we're running forward to hit our bottom. So 
So to, to kind of to your question uh, or your point, that's a cross court approach shot. And in some ways, if you look at directionals, and I've kind of watched directionals for the last 30 years, um, most of the opportunities you get to open the court are from the inside of the court, middle of the court, where you get an inside ball. You will get more inside opportunities than you will get outside line opportunities. And so a good outside ball creates the inside ball. So it's getting really good at the outside ball. That creates the inside opportunity. Oh, that's well and put. I think too often what players work on is they work on the cross court and they work on the line. And what they don't realize, it, and it's amazing how most players rarely ever work on the inside ball. So when I got to Denver, uh, and it was kind of interesting, the, the players, if they got an inside ball, they would basically hit it back through the middle. They couldn't turn on it. So we, had, we actually started with them having to hit the ball wide on purpose and then start to bring it back in. But we literally could not get an inside ball cross court. And, and one, they didn't see it. They, didn't, they weren't aware of what an inside ball was, but they hadn't really practiced it uh, enough. And uh, So you see that a lot of junior tennis. They rarely ever work on the inside. One thing on the cross court approach shots, uh, one of the questions that was sent in was, um, you know, someone who follows the content that we share, we have this free educational content that, you know, you always have people hit straight up the line on approach shots, and that's really not true. Um, the, uh, the cornerstone of what we do is braiding information. And yeah, when you approach cross court, you just have to wait for a shorter ball that's closer to the center, closer to the net. And you, then you got to be able to cover it. You got to be, that's a tough thing. You can't come from the perimeter of the outside of the court. You won't be able to get behind it. Um, mm -hmm. But in doing some homework here, I like how when you said, uh, I've heard you just recently doing review here, slice, drive, and loop. Uh, and then I told Ivana, mm -hmm. Ivana was helping me with the podcast today. So it's just great to hear how people have been in the game for so long will say certain things. And slice, you, you said below the knee and loop above the shoulder. Could you comment on that? Yeah. Um, you know, we're in Colorado, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's our LSD drill, loop, slice, and drive. And, uh, so the way we do the drill on it is you can hit the same ball twice, but not more than twice. So I can loop twice, I can drive twice, and I, or I can slice, slice twice. But what you'll know on the next one, I've got to do a different shot. I can't do three straight slices in a row. Um, but the idea is, and, and the loop, yeah, I, I would call it more of a point-building ball than a, than a loop. Uh, too often when you say kind of loop, people tend to think of it more of a kind of an, a lob-type ball. Um, but I, it would be more of a heavy ground stroke where the ball bounces above your opponent's shoulder. So we're trying to get the ball out of their strike zone, either below their knee or above their shoulder. Uh, and then the drive is the drive, where it's a ball in your strike zone, zone that you like, that you want to put a little more pace on it. Um, but we do that drill. We do that drill a lot. And and we spend a lot of time on the slice. And... Um, it's such an effective shot uh, and, and under underutilized and, and, but it is becoming, you watch, you know, you watch a lot of pro tennis. Uh, there's a lot of slice in the game now um, more so than ever. And then, then that is brought in the drop shot, um, the chip lob uh, back in the vogue. So it's um, in some ways th things come full circle and they're uh, in, in, in all sports, they come full circle. And it's usually a, a response to how the game is being played. So it's fun, fun to see all that. I think recently at the U.S. Open final, I heard Darren Kale mention that uh, Djokovic missed four one-handed underspin backhands. And, you know, he's got such hmm. a great two-hander, but he, he did uh, use the slice. I, I think that's great, the uh, LSD. Hmm. With, you know, people are sent to us to work on technique, and I think many times what happens with players that we work with you know, they come to us and they have some holes in their game and they end up playing too much like a ball machine. They don't really 
mix up the speed, mm-hmm. spin, trajectory, uh, especially the trajectory to hit the ball higher, get it. You know, I always tell people, if I, this comes from Braden as well, if you just hit the first ball high down the middle and if they back up, it's like Braden used to say, how could you lose? You just know they're going to back off the baseline and they, they, and <laughs> right. they, don't, they don't take the ball out of the mm-hmm. air. And just, you know, make those little discoveries when you're first playing someone. Um, but yeah, don't you find that too many kids uh, don't have the variety in their game today? They're just belting balls or just banging away? Yeah, I think, I mean, from a teaching standpoint, uh, movement is something that we have to spend a lot of time on. Techn- technical movement, not just running fast from cone to cone, but how to move on a tennis court. And then uh, volleys, I think volleys are that's probably one technique that you know you go on the internet you're gonna uh probably not get a lot of good information on how to volley properly and then um yeah the transition game i mean i think that's that's junior tennis is typically when you when i talk to a recruit it's like yeah i'm working on transitioning from the baseline to the to the front court but uh but I, I pretty much, I mean, we, we spend a lot of time on movement. And I at Iowa, I was fortunate to work with a guy named uh, Charlie Darley, Chuck Darley. Played at Cal Berkeley. Uh, brilliant guy. PhD. Um, but just kind of a movement guru. And uh, I would think the two guys, I think, that probably affected me more than any, would, and also Steve Stefanke out of Northern Cal. His brother Larry was McEnroe's coach. Yeah, but uh, but with, with Charlie, um, his whole thing was how to move on the court efficiently and to create flow. So there was always it was almost like you were on ice skates on the court, um, and this is hard court. We're not talking clay, but just that there was never any start stop. It was always just continual movement, continual flow, and, and that started with um, what he called the the flow step or the float step where you on weight and instead of splitting landing on both feet you'd land on one foot and push and getting the timing down um but that was almost a new concept for pretty much everybody we worked with uh, which was uh and i'm not sure what you guys are doing with with footwork or, or movement um but when you watch the world's best movers that's how they move um, and i think John Yandel, when he came out with his slow motion footage library, that really opened up uh, pass instruction because now all of a sudden we weren't looking, we weren't, we weren't, we actually could look at what players were actually doing because it was super slow motion. And this was back in the in the late '90s, early 2000s. Yeah, a few things. Uh, <clears throat> some of these names, actually, Chuck Creasy, uh, he was a guest on our podcast. Uh, Back in the day, we used his book, Total Tennis Training, for a textbook mm-hmm. um, that our, where people got an academic degree. I don't have this in my library, but we, we had videos. There was three of them that were produced by um, Steve Stefanke. Uh, we used to show those videos. And I mean, I remember one, was re- he was really big on posture. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Could you say a few th- more things about Steve? Oh, my God. Uh, how long's the podcast? Um, so, <laughs> no, he- now, Stefanke, I read an article of his, and it was in Tennis Weekly, and this must have been bad. It was somewhere in the 90s, but he changed my whole perception of sports. So I read this article, and what he talked about is the world's best athletes play behind the beat. So a college player, and a lot of pros, they play ahead of the beat. So what does that mean? Uh, they're early. Uh, they're, they're anxious. They're a little bit earlier. Um the best athletes or a lot of the good athletes play on the beat, the best play behind the beat. So what does that mean? Uh, and he gave examples like uh, Joe Montana. Uh, he could wait and stay in the pocket and then release the ball at the last possible second. And I think Tom Brady would be somebody like that also. But they were, they were playing with a different sense of time. Bill Russell in basketball, he would wait till the opponent went up to shoot and then he'd jump and block it. So being ahead of the beat, you would jump before you would anticipate and jump. Uh, on the beat, you would probably go up with the player. Behind the beat, you wait. 
because you have a better sense of time. Uh, Wayne Gretzky, slowest skater, guy couldn't bench press 100, best player ever in hockey. And he was always there at the right time. Yeah. Never ahead of the beat, never behind. Always, always had plenty of time. Uh, Muhammad Ali, you throw a punch, he waits for you to throw a punch, and then he moves. Uh, he's not anticipating. And I think anticipation in some ways is, is the big, a, a big problem in tennis. Um, and I like how Paul Anacone said, Fed, you know, he worked with Federer, worked with Sampras, is they had no panic button. Uh, when I'm one of my brothers, uh, was very good around the net, you know, he's just, uh, this kid, Patrick Kane, uh, not a kid anymore, but yeah, I could hold the puck. Uh, I did look up, uh, knowing I was talking to you today is that fan of hockey, uh, Denver, University of Denver said 86 hockey players make it to the NHL. Mm -hmm. But, um, no, that's, then how, how do you teach that? I mean, how would you teach that in well, tennis? Well, yeah, it's interesting because, you know, we're, we're, we're wired to be anxious. So in some ways what you're doing is you're controlling the player's anxiety and getting them to slow down. So, uh, after reading Stefanki's article, and, and this is, this is a good tip for any young coach. Uh, coaches love to spill the cookie. So, I mean, Steve, you call me up and I'll talk tennis all day, but but no one had ever asked. And so what I did is I called up Stefanki and said, hey, I'm going to be in NorCal. Can I come by? We've got a couple of friends. And uh, Joey Scrivano from Baylor, David Thornton, who was at Vanderbilt, uh, we went up to Stefanki's ranch, uh, NorCal up in Napa. And we spent seven hours there. Steve, the fact he's talked for six and a half hours and just everything. And, and it was, it was probably one of my most impactful days. And, and one of the morals of the story, and I'll get back to Stefanki is, uh, coaches are willing to talk to young coaches. You just have to ask. And, and that's how you learn. I, I spent a week with Jeff Moore down in Texas. He had, Won a couple of national titles with uh, with the Longhorns, and he was very gracious. Worked his camp, got to know him, and that's how you develop friendships. But it's also how you become a really a, a good active learner. Uh, but but know that coaches are willing to to share their wisdom with you if you ask. No, I was flattered. Um, you came to. Uh, I was doing a workshop <laughs> at the University of Illinois. Uh, Craig Tyler was a student of ours. Did so many great things in tennis. But that's how I first met you in person. Mm-hmm. So I see your lifelong yeah. learner. That's what that's a great message for the coaches listening to this. Yeah, and it's and it's amazing. And a lot of what I learn, it's not a new drill. Drills are great, but a lot of times, like talking to Stefanki, I you look at the game in a different way. And, and you know, that's that's kind of the history of science. Is it's not that the world changes, but we look at it in different ways. And that's what's interesting with tennis. There's so many different ways to look at it, and and then the trick is to try to assimilate new ideas that work in with your worldview and, and expand your worldview. Um, but Stefanki, to your point earlier, is is a uh, almost a, kind of an Eastern Zen approach, martial arts based. But balance and posture are the foundations of any any sport. Um, and he really pushed that. And that's that's something I learned from from Steve Stefanki, but also. Uh, Chuck Darley and movement, posture, and balance. To me, those are the things that get overlooked a lot in juniors. And too often we think of movement as just being quick around the court, but it's it's staying on balance. And I, I like to say when you hit a ground stroke, you start on balance, you arrive on balance, you finish on balance. And could, you say, could you say you, could you say it again, please? That's great. Yeah. Start, start on balance, arrive on balance, finish on balance. And that's what allows you to flow around the court. And it's that initial movement. Too often we lead with our head. And if you start out of balance, you're going to spend a lot of your time fighting your body, trying to get back into balance. And I always have a saying at camp, gravity is undefeated. And you're not going to fight gravity and win. And the only way to to cooperate with gravity is to move on balance with proper posture. But 
any movement you make, the idea is, and this is martial arts, you have to stay on balance to be effective. And why, why you know, we, we always talk about the greatest of all time, and it's, a, it's the counting of grand slams. Those are five set matches for the men. Who are the best movers? Nadal, Djokovic, Federer. They can last. They can last the four or five hours because they have impeccable balance, great posture, and they move on balance almost always. Yeah, you know, I've heard Joel Trucker, the <clears throat> uh, prolific tennis writer. Um, he's a big fan of Big Braden's, but St- <clears throat> Steve Stefanski is his go-to guy, and that that's that's something that needs to be covered in <clears throat> writing. Um, I think too many times we're always writing about. You know, who won the last major tournament? But I do remember Stefanski uh, reminded me very much of Welby Van Horn in his work. You know, you need to be mm-hmm. on balance mm-hmm. in an off balance position, even when you're stretched out wide. I mean, that's where it was always a delight to watch Federer, where you, the way he would mm-hmm. just float on a tennis court. Yeah. Well, you, know, you watch, you know, it's kind of like watching a, a Fred Astaire uh, dance scene. The guy doesn't, it's just, how do you replicate something like that? It's just so relaxed, the movement, uh, so natural, but perfect posture, perfect balance. I just heard Jimmy Connors, yeah. his wife and daughter were at a dance contest. They compete as dancers, and he was asked uh, if he could do over again, would he um, have dancing be part of his training? Um, yeah, footwork, footwork, footwork. There's uh, Charlie Rose, there's an interview with Feder. He's, he's asked, he asked a young Feder, I think maybe he's 22, he asked him three times in the same interview, how did you get so much better? And his answer each time was footwork. Mm-hmm. His movement. But, yeah, and, I, and I think so often that gets translated to the gym. You know, it's like, we're going to make you quicker. And it's not, you know, it's kind of the Gretzky example. You, you don't, you know, you don't have to be the best athlete. You just have to do it right. And, and a lot of that is, is that first move by staying in balance. Um, John Wooden, his, you know, you always heard that expression from John Wooden, be quick, but don't hurry. And what does that mean? Uh, this is John Wooden's a famous basketball coach, coach at UCLA. And all that means is move as fast as you can on balance. Be quick, but don't hurry. Move as fast as you can on balance. And, you know, it's been preached, but I think it's so often these these concepts get lost um, because, like martial arts, it takes a lot of discipline to do the simple things well. We, we want to move quickly onto the sexy and exciting things, but it's the foundational, the great base uh, that is really the the essentials, and that's. You know, I mean, Feder in that interview is basically telling everybody that. Um, when you see, it's how it, how, go ahead. It's how it's heard and uh, how we translate it. I think it's the problem. I think also too that I mean, certainly <laughs> young young players when they start, they're not muscling the ball because they don't have any muscles. You know, the kids that are really start really <clears throat> young. Um, but with, um, yeah, it just effortless effort. You know, with um, Eugene Scott said, that, you know, the fastest mm-hmm. tennis players in the world wouldn't win a schoolyard race. But I, I think the martial arts, you know, you've, I've traveled and been at this tennis club and that tennis club, and some tennis clubs will rent out space to, uh, you know, judo or karate classes, and you just see them going mm-hmm. very, very slow through movement. And I think that's gone away too much in tennis teaching where we don't even use static balance when we teach. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. No, that's a great point. Yeah, the, the like uh, Taekwondo, they have the forms. And you do the forms at a certain speed, it's slow. Um, but it has to be very precise, it requires a lot of discipline. Um, and it and it's how they teach the foundation. So, yeah, I mean, it's this. Um, and, and Stefanki, that was, he was a big proponent. One of the books he recommended was um, uh, the Bruce Lee book. Which is actually pretty interesting, and, and a lot of the book talks about balance and um, kind of a r- relaxed balance. And his, his brother Larry actually coached more on the tour. I know he, 
You got mm-hmm. Roddick to lose Coach 15. McEnroe. You got you met Coach McEnroe. You got Roddick to lose 15 pounds and helped Roddick with his movement. Um, mm-hmm. With um, another shout out, as you mentioned, John Yandel, I think for our listeners, um, I love the, the the aspect of his, he has a nonprofit and tennisplayer.net. If you want to go back and watch players, he has all this film of old players. Mm-hmm. You know, want to watch Gonzalez or VJ Armitage? I mean, this is Billie Jean King back in the day. One thing, uh, working for Vic Braden years ago, I remember John Yandel, a young John Yandel. He put, I think his first work was uh, his first project. He put a rock and roll tennis video together. And it was with McEnroe and Lendl. And I have that video. Yeah, and I think at that time, those guys weren't even speaking, but he, you know, hats off to John Yandel for uh, what he's done in tennis and making that video. What, 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 what's funny is I use I use that video at my tennis camps to teach the volley, and uh, because we do and I do this with our players too, we we do more McEnroe volleys, and it's kind of a Stefanski thing. But because um, uh, you know McEnroe is probably the best volleyer of all time, one of the best volleyers, and, and and too often people don't try to teach the McEnroe volley because you know, they always say that he had he had such great hands. But it was really McEnroe's feet uh, and his ability to maintain posture and balance through the volley, uh, and and not try to go eyes to the ball. You, you hear that a lot, you know. Get your get your head down to the ball, eyes to the ball. Keep your racket above your wrist. Uh, McEnroe did none of those things. Um, what he did is he maintained perfect posture throughout. And uh, yeah. it was a great match. 80, 84 U.S. Open semis with Connors. Uh, over 140 volleys in that match. Wow. Yeah, listeners, that's an amazing thing. They can look that up and watch it. Yeah, no, I, I watched it last year, and it was like, and the announcer said that up. He's over 130, 130 volleys. I recently watched so, the McEnroe. It's called <laughs> McEnroe Places. Uh, mm-hmm. Archie Manny's son. Uh, it's Eli and help me with the other good. Uh, having a senior moment. Yeah, he was the quarterback at Denver. Um, anyway, the two, the two Manning mm-hmm. brothers. There's a plaque of McEnroe as, as you walk in Flushing Meadows and he's hitting the volley and yeah, the posture's up and the, the elbow's raised and the racket face is vertical. But I think also too, watching someone like McEnroe mm-hmm. at the hit, you know, and see, you know, checking the checkpoints, like where he is and such. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've got this down, Paul, in my notes, uh, listening to you on tape. I love this. Uh, you're talking about one of your players, and you said she played with total abandon. Then I, you know, loving that statement, you know, I think it's a great exercise to look a word up in the dictionary. So I mm-hmm. did that, and it said a complete lack of inhibition, no restraint. <clears throat> and then I mm-hmm. added, you know, no insecurities. It seems like so many kids have insecurities. You know, we mm-hmm. will. Then so then there's a, usually when you look a word up there's a sentence that goes with it and it says uh, she sings and sways with total abandon. You know mm-hmm. we ask players right on the spot sometimes hey sing the alphabet hey <laughs> sing you know hey it's so and so and so's birthday pretending it's so and so's birthday sing happy birthday and then mm-hmm. and they just they just freeze you know total total stage fright. But could you comment a little bit on that statement? Play you want your players yeah. to play with total abandon. Yeah. It's interesting, and I mean, you you did a great job kind of describing what's going on. I can add probably one more little layer to that, but too often we're players are self conscious, and the idea is to eliminate those boundaries and kind of obstacles that keep them from really letting their body play the way it is capable of playing. And, and that can be a little inner game, you know, it's like turning off the, the self one. So the self two, which is the body can just, just flow and, and do what it wants to do, uh, get out of the way. And the abandoned part is just total freedom to do that. And, and, and I'd, I'd use another word too, is just to play with spirit, to be a spirited individual out there. And, um, you know, you think about, um, there's a great concept for coaches, and, and I, I like this. This is St. Thomas Aquinas, uh, Scott Peck in his book, The Road Less Traveled. Uh, his definition of love is to 
uplift your own or another spirit. And when you think about it, that's what we do as coaches if we're doing a good job, is to allow them to be who they are, but to give them a sense of freedom that allows their spirit to shine through and, and to, to play in a spirited way. And uh, this is kind of a, a, kind of a cool definition of, of love, is to uplift your own or another spirit. Oh, that's and great. Part, of, part I think- of that is just the freedom to play and to be, be who you are. No, that's uh, something golden nugget. We always say that we have these podcasts, <laughs> so you have a tennis treasure chest. Um, that's something to write on the bathroom wall. That's outstanding. The, the, the idea of play with total abandon made me think of uh, Andy Fitzell, a coach that I've worked with for a long time. And he, he trained to be an actor at one time. So improv, improvisation, you know, it, it's, it's anything and everything. It's fun. It's no stage fright. It's unplanned, unscripted. Um, with, you know, getting kids to, you know, going to the nets, like trying new things. Uh, one thing that I think is going away to besides static balance is, it seems to me that kids don't play much mini tennis anymore. And I do think when people years ago just took a private lesson, kids would hang out and play mini tennis against each other for Mountain Dew and absolutely love it and play all day. You know, we have different versions where we, mini tennis mm-hmm. one, you got to stay back. Mini tennis two, you can come in. Mini tennis three is what the pros used to do years ago on one service box. Just in, in the server has to serve and come in. You give the mm-hmm. um, returner the option. And certainly, as you know, I'd like to actually go with the, some of the drills you have for directionals mm-hmm. as well. But you can you can change the, all the variables. Um, we do one, skip in mini tennis four. Mini tennis five, We it's... it's you got to do, you got an emergency shot. You got to serve backwards like Burwash used to do teaching the serve. So the, you know, the people don't go palm up where they look straight ahead and, and patty cake the ball into the box. But we do uh, mini tennis five where it's three hits, uh, where it's, you know, you stop it instead of the second hit, you stop it, second hit. And then you, with the second hit, you cut the ball where the ball goes behind you. Then we say mini tennis five with a Hollywood twist. <laughs> and and the the kids just have so much fun. Mini tennis for the pros now. That's what they do at the end of practice. They'll hit down like they're playing ping pong, and they do it in one box. We do it in two, and it teaches ball sense and it helps them get their racket face closed, and it's fun. But um, yeah, I think tennis in a lot of ways is too structured now. Where um, I like what you said about freedom is that it's amazing. You know, kids they play some pickup soccer and they go to lunch. They play some pickup you know, ultimate Frisbee basketball, they go to lunch and they don't remember who was on their team. They just had fun. But if, if a group of say, you know, 16 kids, you know, there's eight singles matches played and you go to lunch, by the time they get back, everybody knows what the score was of all eight, eight matches. The, uh, I like that what you said too about anxiety. Um, yeah, to free people of anxiety. The one thing I, well, I often, go ahead, yeah. go ahead. I was just going to say, too often in our culture, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to alleviate, to, to eliminate anxiety. And it's, 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 a, it's more about, it, it, it's, a, it's who we are. It's what makes us human. Uh, it's what separates us from the animals. And uh, it, it's going to be there. So then the trick is how to, kind of how to maintain it, control it, uh, and, and live with it, uh, especially on, on, in, on the athletic fields because uh, that's when it really gets magnified. Uh, in tennis, typically, it's if you watch a tennis match, big points, and you saw that this year at the U.S. Open, um, cross-court rally, they miss wide, they're early. Cross-court rally, they hit it in the net, they're early. Um and all those early errors are anxiety errors. And they, and it's like the, I think when Djokovic missed some of his uh, one-handed backhands, they were on big moments. And he was early. So yeah, just, you know, I ask kids um, early or late, you know, and I think today with uh, kids seeing so much film, um, and I think they would, you know, static balance many times. I think also too is that the follow-through is not, in, is not emphasized <laughs> Or it's misinterpreted where the the uh, recovery is mistaken as a follow through, and you know people are 
copying what the what the pros look like at the end. In other words, what's happening versus what's happened. And I ask kids all the time, were you early or late? And they think being mm-hmm. late is a bad thing. They, they miss those. They're all late. I go, no, you weren't late. You were early. And, you know, but also too today, um, you know, obviously you've been coaching a long time. I, 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 I think you get a blank stare when you tell, and years ago it wasn't fair for girls, but you tell a talking to a boy and go, well, it's like a change up in baseball. Then you have to wait a minute and go, they don't know baseball. Mm-hmm. You know, years ago, even in America, if you didn't play baseball, you knew baseball, you knew, you, you knew what a change up was. But yeah, I think a lot of times people are, um, in the way the brain works too, they're a fifth of a second ahead of their hand. So yeah, they sneak a peek. And I was going to ask you about, uh, something I heard you say confidence uh, comes many ways. And one is by being able to make lots and lots of balls. Could you, comment on that yeah i mean that's that's kind of the my definition of tennis confidence is if you want to have tennis confidence in tennis hit the ball on the court and and if you're in a match and you're losing confidence uh, you just have to make more balls and you probably have to go more of a you know it could be just more of a point building mindset until you get the feel you get the flow get the confidence back but it's uh, it's making balls um, that's pretty pretty simple definition of tennis confidence. Yeah, another thing you say many times. Uh, I've been charting how many times you say flow. Uh, mm-hmm. With uh, in looking at uh, the the tape, um, I've got it written down here. So you know, Paul Ward, a lot of tennis directionals is Joanne Russell is on the court, yep. and mm-hmm. you know she was. Uh, I met her through uh, experiences with the University of Florida, University of Illinois, and I remember my kids were very young, my two boys, and she, you know, she just loves to hit balls. Mm-hmm. But now for our listeners, um, she's uh, making, she has pickleball, um, oh. pickleball lessons online, and I heard her say that a chip and a volley are, a chip and a low volley are basically the same thing. It's just that a chip bounces. But she uh, she was saying flow many times, and that's why I started I started telling it when you started saying flow because uh, obviously you you influenced her tennis, and going on a tangent about pickleball, I'm always telling people right now is that we have to embrace pickleball; it's here to stay. But we as tennis teachers need to tell people, okay, learn tennis skills to play pickleball. Um, mm-hmm. Because that anyway, um, why does, what comes to your mind with Joanne Russell? You made that video with her a long time ago. Well. Um- I didn't really know Joanne that well, and Human Kinetics is based out of Champagne. Oh, okay, Boy. that's right. And so we made we shot the video there, and uh, the other the gentleman in the video was David Thornton, who was the assistant at Vanderbilt. He's a teaching pro in Knoxville, and brilliant, brilliant guy. Kind of a, a little bit of a Zen background, um, just a good, good tennis mind. And we we became good friends and shared a lot of ideas. And then Joanne, I needed ideally, uh, we wanted to have a male and a female in the video and okay. Joanne being a, a Wimbledon uh, doubles champ uh, fit the bill. She didn't really know directional uh, until that video. And when you make a video like that, you look at it, it's like, oh, it's a half hour video. It probably took them two hours to make. No, we went, we went six hours the first day and four hours the second day to get enough quality clips to make it a, a 30 minute video. And uh, I don't think David could move for the next uh, next couple of weeks after that when he was back. We, um, but that's how I got to know Joanne. Uh, and, Joanne, and she Joanne. actually go ahead. After doing directionals for ten hours in two days, uh, she really understood it pretty well by the end. And uh, I know that they started using that uh, with the Illinois kids on the on the women's team. Yeah, I know. I, Joanne was eleven in the world. Um, she grew up right behind Chris Everett. Same, you know, she's from the same age group and grew up in Florida. But she played Chris Everett. And uh, because of that, you know, she didn't think she was that good in juniors, but she was really good. She played, I think, at Trinity for, no, no, she played mm-hmm. at Trinity, right? And then um, yeah. turned pro. And I mean, I think one year at Wimbledon quarters and three events. And, uh, but one thing with her is she came to spend time with us, um, you know, through, understanding what was going on with the men's team with Craig Tyler, Illinois, she came down and mm-hmm. hung out with us. So, um, yeah, I forgot the human kinetics. Uh, they, uh, that's right. They're in Champagne. Uh, yeah, they, go ahead. 
Well, they they were the publishers of the uh, Pressure Tennis book. And well, we usually ask that at the end, but how can people get a copy of that? Is it still published? Uh, it is, but well, no, it's not still published. It, they made they printed seven thousand copies, and so those are those have all been sold. And uh, if you go, <laughs> this is pretty funny. Somebody told me yesterday that they went to find a copy of Pressure Tennis in, on the used market, eight hundred dollars. Yeah, so it's like when I figure that one out. But um, I'll probably get inundated. But I'm happy to send people a PDF copy. Uh, it would be in, in two emails. I I just made a PDF of the first half and a PDF of the second. So, no, that's we have this nonprofit effort and we're giving out free educational content. Uh, you know, Welby Van Horn's sons and uh, the author Ed Weiss. They've uh, they've agreed to. Uh, Allow us to put well the book he wrote on Welby online, and yeah, I could oh, okay. I, I could well, follow I could follow up with you. That um, yeah, happy to happy to send that your way and uh, make it available to whomever. And what's funny about writing a book? I think my take home on that was seventy five cents a book. So uh, you're, you're definitely not doing it for the money, and uh, um, but it was a great experience having to having to write a book. Um, and you did that through human kinetics as well? Yes, that's through, through human kinetics. Uh, we talked about uh, getting Bill Bruns online, uh, who wrote Braden's books. Um, how did they do that with human kinetics? Did they just have, they just had someone come and you, you talked to well, until and they wrote it or did you write it yourself? No, I, no, I wrote it. I wrote oh, it. We wow. had young children. They were, we had a third grader and a kindergarten and, uh, so they would go to bed at eight thirty, and I would write from eight thirty to ten thirty every night. So, uh, and we were on a, you know, we were on a deadline. They basically gave me oh, about eight months to write the book, and uh, so that's what I would do. And um, you know, had a lot of drills, and diagrams, and um, like anything, and it was was, anything was discipline then for you yeah. to put it together. And uh, and you know, my first chapter, it's amazing. I wrote it and it was like one page long and, and until, you know, like anything, writing's a habit and, and a practice and you got to get into it and you got to spend the time. And then all of a sudden uh, the words come and uh, you become a little more descriptive and a little more verbal and, uh, and you end up with a book at some point. But, um, and yeah. So that's, that's, it was, it was a good experience and that was in 2000. So now here we are in, 2023 uh and it's amazing kind of all the different things that have happened since then and, and, and different ways of looking at the game and uh, so, so it's, it's been a it's been a fun journey in that regard yeah one of your uh, your biggest fans chuck Reese. uh i like how he just says we need you know we all spend so much time on how to hit a ball but very little time on where to hit a ball mm -hmm. um I, th I think you can actually go out and just say, okay, let's just base our, our the lesson on where to hit. And then through that, people start hitting the ball better. Yeah. What is the old, there's an expression about the, uh, the tactics teach technique. In other words, technique is a, a response to what you're trying to do tactically. Yeah. For the, and that's where the, the games based approach ha has value. Um, that you're based on the game. You've got a, supply the proper tactics to do what you need to do to yeah. be successful in the game. For our listeners with game based is uh, mm -hmm. it's a lot more fun too. We, we say, okay, let's, let's combine game based with form based and call it principle based. Mm -hmm. um, for the listeners, uh, if you just type out tennis fan 68 YouTube, um, that's where you, had, you know, Chuck Reese is talking about word law directionals. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you don't have to mention any names, but with I said when I introduced you uh, prior to calling you that uh, you got to scroll down to listen to Paul Wardlaw talk about Wardlaw directionals because there's many others. Um, do you find that people misinterpret what you've put together? They oh, get, a little, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, there's there's a guy who runs a camp, uh, one of the first recruiting camps, and uh, 
he basically when he he was like his whole tactical system was based on directional <clears throat> and then i worked his camp one time and it was like well uh you're not teaching it right because <laughs> it was basically he an inside ball was any ball that landed in the middle of the court and which was totally different than what an inside ball is it's, it's got to be in relationship to the player, the ball in relationship to the player. But yeah, there's there's always, you know, there's always pe- how people look at it or, or hear it uh, can be interpreted differently. Um, but there is a, I think if you just look, if you went on YouTube and you typed in uh, P. Wardlaw, uh, Utah, YouTube, there's a 30 minute version and there's a five minute version. I did a, I edited it is down to a five minute version, which just kind of gives you the, the the basics of an inside outside and a 90 degree change of direction. Um, but you can, you can find that human kinetics video on there. And that's probably your better source rather than listening to uh, somebody interpret it. Yeah, for sure. I uh, <clears throat> can't find it here in my notes, um, but yeah, it's about 35 minutes long and mm-hmm. um yeah, I just I have it in my notes, but uh, I don't see it here. Let me ask you, um, you know, some things in high percentage tennis by Paul Wardlaw. Um, I like how you say odds of winning. Um, fewer errors, the right type of errors. Could you comment on the right type of errors? Well, yeah, you, you know, you're going to have. I think we're you want to make the distinction between tactical errors and technical errors, and we can miss a shot. Let's say we, let's say I want to, I want to hit the ball to the open court and I should go 90 degrees and I spray the ball a little wider and I miss wide. So the tactical error is not going 90 degrees. Uh, Now, is there a technical error? Could be, Um, but it's important for the players to be able to make, to be aware of that distinction. Did I make a tactical error? Did I make a technical error? Um, and again, directionals, you know, the video is high percentage tennis. You're playing high percentage tennis. So uh, you're going to make mistakes. Tennis is a game of mistakes. But the idea is to try to manage uh, those mistakes as best as possible. Um, so that's, that's playing the odds. With your time with Chuck Greasy, do you get into, you know, game pressure, momentum, and uh, when, when to attack and when not to attack? Yeah, we do. Well, it's interesting. We're now, you know, college tennis is no ad scoring. So you have – it's different with – Creasy's momentum uh, guides are, are pretty interesting. Um, what I've taken from that, and this may be too much for the listeners just because uh, – he, he talked about breakdown points uh, with momentum, controlling the momentum. And it's it's a tricky concept, but we do with our players, we do talk about breakdown points. And breakdown points are, are basically uh, you're playing high percentage tennis. You'll take an opening if it's given, but you're not trying to create too much. You're trying to break down your opponent by playing high percentage tennis. Make Make them change direction first. Make them try to create. And then the question is, when do you use breakdown tactics? And I would say with no ad scoring, it's going to be more out of the deuce court. So if you're up 30 love uh, or you're up 40, 15, and that's the point I see often that flips the game in no ad scoring. You're up 40, 15, you're serving, uh, you relax a little bit, you, you get comfortable and you make a quick error. Now, all of a sudden, it's 40-30. No ad scoring, it's two points. Uh, it's, it's not hard to win two straight points. It's hard to win three straight points. And uh, that's a huge momentum shift. So a lot of times at 40-15, we'll play a breakdown point. And I think one of the advantages of that is it really dials in the player to be purposeful and, and to have a strategy at, at, at that score. So I think that's one of the values of uh, – um, controlling the momentum. And elaborate upon a breakdown point. <clears throat> like what is a breakdown point? Yeah. Just, just different ways to share that with the listeners. Yeah. Well, well um, a breakdown point is where you're, 
you're trying to break down your opponent into making a mistake, to making the error. But, you know, like so approach shots or approach volleys, oh, okay. serve, serve volley. Uh, well, I think, I think it's more from a directional standpoint, you hold the angle. Uh, and, you know, you just play simple directionals. Outside ball, no change of direction. Inside ball, change direction. Uh, avoid the 90-degree change of direction. That's where probably 85, 90% of tennis errors are made when people change direction on the outside ball. So avoid that. Make them have to beat you with a change of direction. Yeah, when they change that ball also, too, many times they're behind the baseline <clears throat> and the contact points above waist mm -hmm. level. And, uh, yeah, it becomes, a, a, was it a comedy or a tragedy of errors? Um, uh, <laughs> Welby Van Horn used to always ask people, I mean, everybody, say, how do you develop a ten <clears throat> tennis mind? With all these years, I mean, you played two sports in college, and then you've coached more than just tennis. I'd like to go back. Uh, tell us one more time when you were at Illinois, the five different jobs you had. I think young coaches need to hear that. What were the five jobs? Yeah. Well, I was uh, head men's tennis coach, uh, started men's soccer. So my first year, I show up. They'd spent a year recruiting. We had 13 players. I got hired in August. Preseason starts August 15th. And we've got 13 players. Uh, and we're playing defending national champ Rockford College <laughs> our first year because they were in, the, in, in our conference. Um, so it was going to be, it was an interesting year. We went uh, one thirteen and one And believe me, the tie was a celebration and the win was a major celebration. Uh, and then the next year, here, here's the irony, the next year we won the league. Wow. Yeah. And what I did is I spent a ton of time going into inner city Chicago and just recruiting kids. Uh, and tennis, uh, I was there four years at Illinois Benedictine. And um, then I also was intramural director, facilities director, and I taught in the philosophy department. And uh, so I, I did graduate work in philosophy. It was in a PhD program for three years, taught at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and then taught philosophy at, uh, at uh, Illinois Benedictine. And I would say it's interesting. Uh, philosophy has been a great kind of a – backdrop for as a college coach and 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 probably more so as a learner if you ever read philosophy you can kind of read anything um, just because it's, it's pretty dense and it's pretty heavy and requires a some discipline and focus but um i think one of the one of the things we do i see that might be of interest to some of the college coaches is we we do a kind of a conceptual based team building program and we call it Players Club. And like at Denver, we'll have a Players Club meeting this Friday. And, and the conceptual side is back in 1993, we won a national championship. And we went from 10th to 8th to 2nd to 1st. And that summer, I crashed and burned. I was depressed. I canceled all my camps. I didn't want to do tennis. I couldn't do anything with tennis. And part of it was we had this goal in mind and we reached it, but there wasn't anything after that. And that was probably the mistake. Um, and you read that in a lot of sport biographies. There's a sense when you win the first championship and then the question is, well, is that all there is? Is this it? And, and kind of the joy is a little bit ephemeral. It's, it's here, but then it's gone. And so that summer, my thought was, I want to do it again, but I don't want to do it this way. And there has to be something else. And so with my assistant, sharp guy, Episcopal priest, uh, volunteer guy, he's making 500 bucks uh, coaching, as assistant at Kenyon. We sat down and mapped out um, how, do we, how do we run a program that has meaning and purpose? And we came up with the idea that it was going to be relationship-based. That was going to be the focus of the program. And what we did is we focused on six relationships. And the goal is to have healthy relationships in these six areas. And the six are 
player to self, player to teammate, player to team, player to coach, player to sport, and player to parent. And so then the purpose of our players club is to talk about how to have healthy relationships in those six areas. What is what are the essential features of a healthy relationship between me, a, a player to player? And, and it's interesting, our, our first meeting at Denver, we bring the team in, they've never met me in person. And we have our first team meeting and I write on the board, humans are relational. And they're looking at me like, what? What are we, what are we going to talk about? And I asked them, I go, in, in your life, what do you guys feel like are the important relationships from a, kind of the big perspective? And here's what's really cool. This is from Martin Buber, uh, who's a uh, kind of a mystical theologian, but that's one of his statements. Humans are relational. And for Buber, the three areas that are important for us as humans are relationships with other beings, could be animals, but people nature and the spiritual and our Denver kids in the span of about 10 minutes, that's what they came up with. They came up with relationships with others, with nature and with the spiritual. And then we said, all right, we're a tennis team. We're going to have relationships with each other. What are the important relationships? And they come up with self, teammate, team, coach, the sport, and their parent. And, and what's interesting is no one had ever asked them. And, and it's always it's a little Socratic, you know, uh, if you ask the right questions. And that's kind of what we should be doing as coaches is asking the right questions. Uh, and it's amazing what the players know. So, no, so, go ahead. so that's, so from a, in our players club, what we do is we work on, and there's kind of four statements that I like, you know, you always want to start with, and this is kind of like Barbara Woodhouse wrote a book about training dogs. And I think the name of the book was, there are no bad dogs. But in the first page, she talks about, well, what is a dog? You can't train the dog unless you understand what the dog is. And it's probably not the best metaphor here, but uh, what is a person? What are we dealing with? Who are we dealing with? And there's different ways. And I, I think there's four human statements that I like. Humans are relational. Humans are meaning seekers. Humans are creators. And I'm forgetting one. Uh, I'm having my senior moment. Uh, but with those, oh, I know, uh, this is more of an African motif. Humans are storytellers. And what's interesting with all of those, you know, they, they all kind of intersect and they all, they all uh, relate to one another. But when you start with that, um, with those questions, it, it's amazing the conversations that are created and, you know, my, my interest in philosophy was existentialism. And the whole idea behind this existential, and I, I can just give you a quick, you're really focusing on kind of four, four or five main themes. One is death. One is freedom. One is isolation. One is meaning. And I would throw in love that we talked about earlier. But what's interesting with those you know, death sounds pretty dreary, but really when you talk about any, any time you're around death, any time you read about death, it's really about how to live. It's not necessarily about the end. And most of the stories you, you hear about death, it's about how to live. Uh, freedom, that we make choices, that we're responsible for things. Um, Isolation is interesting because I can never know what it's like to be Steve Smith. You can never know what it's like to be me. And there's always that kind of uh, sense of isolation, alienation, that we can never know what it's like to be another. And for a lot of high school kids, 
they have that realization by, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, that uh, <laughs> they're on their own. They're a free agent. They're not connected to anyone. And then meaning, I think meaning, being a meaning seeker is uh, so often in my story about winning the national championship uh, was kind of my pursuit of trying to find meaning in what I was doing as a coach besides winning. And then, and then love, which is really what we should be doing as coaches, which is uplifting another spirit. Oh, that's, so, so, that's so well put. Uh, I'll come back to this. I was going to ask, uh, yeah. I'll get to it where uh, you you spent so much time around other coaches that I know at the end of this podcast, you're going to a meeting with the head coaches and, and then come back to in particular Dean Smith. But so the relationship agenda, let me turn ahead where, um, in just researching, doing some homework for this podcast, uh, from Brown university, the Risa fund, Marissa, amazing story, a tribute to one of your mm -hmm. former players, uh, passed away at a young age. And now there's this nonprofit. I think go Bruno is uh, part of that story. Um, could you talk a little bit about her? As far as uh, tied in with relationships and such, or the team. Yeah, that, and that's a that's a tough story too. Um, and uh, she passed away a year after graduating from Brown, and um, struggled with some mental health issues. And um, but a beautiful beautiful person, um, very spirited, played with abandon. Uh, what I love about Marissa and stories that I would tell about Marissa is the Ivy League is filled with blue chip players. And Marissa was a high four, low five star player and never lost to a blue chipper. And she just had this tremendous will. And, but a smart player and not a great athlete, but one of our best movers. And um, just a just a cool kid, and um, and obviously um, passed way before her time. And her parents started a fund in in D.C. Uh, her dad's a psychiatrist. Uh, he's passed away since. Uh, the mom is still in D.C. And it was basically promoting. And, and Marissa was an artist, and the kind of person that would. Uh, give her time freely and would treat anyone, everyone the same that she would treat her best friend. She was always just kind of uh, with an open heart, uh, always upbeat, great listener, wanted to hear their story. Um, so, but they started a, a fund where it was basically inner city art projects and, and uh, Marissa had done some work in the summers in D.C., but it was to, um, that was their way of, of honoring Marissa. Um, and that, that hit us pretty hard um, because, and it was, oh, God, I forget. It was like in February or March, right in the middle of our season. And, uh, you know, most of the players had played with Marissa, knew Marissa. So it was, that was a tough, tough day, tough phone call. Uh, tough service to go to and have to speak. Yeah. Tough to talk about now. You know, college teammates, um, it's amazing. Um, with uh, all the people I know that played college tennis, it's like right across the board, 100% say it was greatest time of their life being a college teammate. Mm -hmm. uh, coming back to coaches, uh, you're a great listener. Um, that must have that must be a highlight of your career, having spent so much time around coaches of other sports as well. Mm -hmm. You talk a little yeah. bit about that. Uh, well, Illinois Benedictine. It, it's, it's funny if I look at kind of my coaching mentors, and I think one of the I don't know, you can call it a pro or con, but I never had a good tennis mentor growing up. So my dad was a Presbyterian minister. Uh, made very little money. A lesson, a private lesson for a half hour was $5. We could afford maybe two or three a summer. So, uh, wow. so I, I learned how to play on the wall and I learned how to play by uh, reading tennis magazine and watching tennis on TV. And this was back in the day when they had the clay court circus circuit in the summer that was on PBS, so you could watch it 
every Monday night they had the finals. You could yeah. watch during the weekend. Um, but that's how I learned how to play tennis. So I didn't know anything. And, you know, and, and I studied the game. I was, my brother and I were teaching pros at this little club when we were 18 and 16 because it was just like a little neighborhood place. So, you know, I, I knew enough to be dangerous. And so I've had to spend my life, tennis life, uh, learning and obviously played at a decent level, but never the highest level. Um, so, so that's kind of the, uh, a little bit of the tennis background. Oh, I remember those Monday night finals, uh, <clears throat> uh earlier today, I made a, a training tape for Christina Dell, Donna Dell's <clears throat> daughter. And the purpose mm -hmm. of the, you know, she played at Yale. The purpose of the video is to have her go through it with her eight and 10 year old sons. But actually <laughs> those, that was a super thing on it. Uh, it was 75, 76, 77. U S open was on a hard true. It, mm -hmm. um, it was still when it was at Vilas. Forest mm -hmm. Hills. Yeah. Vilas. And in fact, to this kind of day, um, Jimmy Connors is a great thing for the listeners. Um, all the people from Argentina that were in New York, they stormed the court, remember? And the mm -hmm. last call was in question, but it was like a soccer game and they had Vilas up <laughs> on their shoulders. And Jimmy Connors to this day, I believe he lost that set six love, but because they never made a ruling on the last call, Connor, Connors goes, I never lost that match. But uh, it was Donald Dell who got Vic uh, Braden. PBS didn't have the uh, public commercials, but they had the timeouts. And that's where he got, that's how. You know, he he got his start because uh, Donald Donald Dell was mentored by Vic Braid by Donald Dell was mentored by Jack Kramer. Vic Braden was mentored by. Um, they both were mentored by Jack Kramer, and and that that's how Vic got his start on TV. That was a fun time in tennis. The tiebreaker just come in the scene on the scene, and mm -hmm. but tell us a little bit about Dean Smith. Uh, I mean, I certainly remember well, Dean Smith, oh, yeah. but how he I, sounds like he really influenced your tennis. Well, here's here's how it came to pass. So I'm an Illinois Benedictine, and I was talking about my mentors and kind of got sidetracked. Um, there was a guy, Dick Maurer, was our equipment room manager. He was a good basketball coach. Uh, his life took some different turns, twists and turns, and ended up in our equipment room. And I would talk to him all the time. And he, as a basketball coach, he was a Dean Smith fan, and then – there was a guy, junior college coach, who was charting all his basketball practice. And he gave me a little two-page handout on what this guy was doing. So I incorporated that with our soccer program. I didn't incorporate it with tennis initially. And so we would chart all our soccer drills. And um, and so that's where the idea came in to it's basically hold the players accountable, keep, make them responsible for, for their practices and, and try to get better as a team. So we did that. And uh, when I went to Kenyon, because I was coaching three sports at the same time, uh, we had a, well, actually we lost a, we lost a, we lost a match in the national finals in 91. We were up 3-0 in the third set and we ended up losing 5-4. And that match cost us, and that team we lost to ended up winning the national title. So we were close. We had a team meeting that night. And the players, we go in there, and I told my assistant, eh, I don't have a good feeling about this meeting. And we go into the meeting, and the players just blasted us for three hours. Uh, and they, they weren't happy with this and that. And my assistant made the mistake of saying, well, mommy and daddy can't buy you a national championship. So – that, that kind of stirred the pot even more. Uh, but what I said is, look, I go, guys, I know how to fix this. Uh, we'll, we'll make things better. And what they didn't realize, they had opened Pandora's box because when you do this system, the players are 100% held accountable. And they had no idea what they were getting into. So because you measure and count, uh, it's a lot of competition against your peers. With the games approach, it's pretty tough, and uh, but we got a lot better with that system, and uh, uh, and use that. I use that really for the rest of my career at Kenyon. We won three national titles using that, and then my first two years at Iowa, <clears throat> Iowa was interesting because we had a team of uh, kind of a young team, and I only had one scholarship. So the first year we finished 
seventh in the Big Ten, and we started off, I think we were 12th when I got there. First year, we finished seventh. The second year, we made the round of 16s at the NCAAs with only one new player. Wow. And, and then and that's when Pressured Tennis was published. So everybody thought that I had the secret sauce to something. And uh, we actually had a big, big crowd listen to the, the talk at the ITA convention. But what we did with that group, we did players club. We really focused on our relationships and we did that uh, practice system where we recorded every drill. And those two things, that, that team really took off uh, over over two years. But, uh, no, that's, that was probably a career highlight, just getting to the round of 16 NCAA, even, even more so than, than the national championships at Kenya. The uh, Iowa, I want to come back to Dean Smith, but uh, I once sure. uh, heard a comedian who had an acronym for every state, and the only one I could remember, I've looked it up to it, and I've never been able to find it, but uh, idiots out wandering around, or you can change it to intellectuals out wandering around, and they do have a very high literacy rate, maybe the highest in the state. But mm -hmm. a, a tangent, what do you think of uh, Iowa? They don't have men's tennis anymore. What, do you, what comes to your mind when you hear that question? Oh, that's sad. That's sad, and and no reason. Uh, and, and and you know, you take something. I think when Iowa dropped their program, the men that uh, kind of gave Minnesota permission to drop theirs too, because now all of a sudden it's not just one program being dropped. And the sad part was they had a brand new facility. They had a good program. They were uh, what top thirty, I think. Uh, Minnesota fully funded. Scholarships were fully funded. The head coaching position was fully funded. They had a brand new facility. Why would you have to drop those programs? So and so that to me that's that's the, that those are sad stories. Yeah. Then how the decision is made because it's a public public institution as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, in college athletics, that's a whole other conversation and. You wonder what the future looks like, uh, especially for – I'm an older coach, but for the younger coaches, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Coming back to history, UNC, Dean Smith, but I, I was um, traveling through Raleigh with Austin Krychek, and uh, I spoke to the NC State men's team. I think that's how it went. But uh, So there was an older trainer, older than me at that time, and I just said uh, – were you working here when uh, Jim Valvano won the, I think it was 83, they won the NCAA mm -hmm. National Basketball Championship? And he goes, I was the fitness coach. So <laughs> the, the beauty of that is I was scheduled to talk to these guys for an hour and a half. And uh, I thought it was a great session. I just asked him questions for an hour and a half. And then uh, I don't want to be doom and gloom, but I, you know, then, uh, then I, came back and I reprimanded the guys after he left. I said, you guys didn't even know who he was. He's, he's working as your trainer. Like you said earlier, <laughs> I said, you guys haven't even asked him. I showed up and said, Hey, it's kind of like asking somebody, I uh, asked a woman one time, uh, where were you during Pearl Harbor? And she said, I was an intern for FDR. And you know, it's kind of like people our age, you know, Hey, where were you and Kennedy was shot or where were you during mm -hmm. nine, nine 11? But, um, with uh, history is an amazing thing. With, I uh, so you took a short hiatus from being a college coach all these years. Tell us a little bit about being an athletic director at a. Is it was the prep school grade one through twelve or is it nine through twelve? Uh, nine through twelve oh, and okay. one hundred and fifty students. And my role there was uh, athletic director. First year I coached soccer, uh, ran the ran the tennis program, and uh, taught philosophy classes. Uh, so. Uh, did what, existential philosophy, existential film, even did a history of rock and roll class, which was a lot of fun. Um, but so in, in, enjoy that. And what a different environment. Uh, I would arrive on campus at 745, work till 630, uh, eat dinner at home, do a two hour prep for a class the next day. And uh, if, if college coaches think they work hard, Prep schoolers have them by a long time, by a long margin. Uh, it's a, it's a, it was a grind, and 
two things happened uh, that kind of altered the experience. Um, one was right before COVID. This was early February. We had an accidental death on campus. And uh, when you have this small, intimate group of people, when something like that happens, that just rocks the place. And uh, and then a month later, we have COVID. And that, that really uh, affected the experience, obviously, for the students, but also for faculty and staff. Um, and, and, you know, the value of, the value of COVID is you, you take stock. You've got a lot of downtime to think about what you want to do in, with your life. And what I realized at that moment was, uh, hey, I want to get back into, into college coaching. So that was how I got back into it. But I think the, the value in the prep school world for me was getting away from tennis. I'd coach 33 years. Wow. Three, yeah, 30, 33 years as a head college coach. Oh, wow. So and Brown, we were, it. yeah, so Brown, I'd been there 14 years. I, you know, uh, you talked to Dave Schwartz recently, and then right. he was the men's coach when I was there part, part of the time. Uh, Brown was a little stagnant. We didn't have a facility. We didn't have the leadership was not that creative at the, at that time. They've got a great new AD in there now who's a go-getter. Um, so I needed a change. And we'd gotten our kids through college, and I knew the board chair, and I knew the head of the school. And so when the AD job opened up, they called, and <clears throat> I thought for about 30 seconds, I said, yeah, this sounds like fun. And we we bought a nice place up in New Hampshire, so <clears throat> allowed us to get up there uh, earlier than later but, Let, um, but go ahead go ahead Steve. i was going to ask uh, at prep school <laughs> is it still a throwback where you have to you have to play a different sport every season you do um we have three seasons we have the fall we have the winter and the spring and we've got obviously multi-sport athletes and um yeah uh and the kids that would come out of there that would go on. We had some D3 basketball players. We had one tennis guy who ended up playing up at St. Lawrence, D3. Uh, Nordic skiers, we were kind of known for our Nordic ski program. We had a ski club in town. We had a, a world-class ski, a Nordic ski venue on campus. Um, our head of school had skied at Dartmouth, had done crew at Dartmouth. A uh, great group of coaches, holy smokes. We had a, an Olympian as our crew coach. Uh, our Nordic ski coach was the head of school who'd done that at Dartmouth, super serious guy. I knew all the national coaches. Uh, I was doing tennis, soccer. We brought in a young guy that had played at a high level that was a, a club coach. Uh, basketball, we brought in a, a great guy, um, Mike Kelly, who um, uh, won a NEPSAT championship with, with the crew. So, so it was a really cool environment that we were able to create. And, you know, kind of my role was to try to help the coaches become better coaches and uh, do a lot of scheduling and obviously run the tennis program. But uh, it's a different world. The prep school world is a different world, and it's changed. You know, our our motto was <clears throat> truth and courage. And, you know, back in the day, it was more about character development. And now – we're so personality driven as a culture. It's more like you almost want to put the words, my truth and my courage uh, in their, in their mottos because um, you know, everything has become a little bit too, a little bit more relative. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, what is courage? Well, you know, for a lot of the kids, uh, it's, it's become less value based. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah. And I think that's pretty universal, universal in the prep schools. It's, uh, it's gotten away from what they were about uh, initially. Yeah, I was talked to you about earlier that <laughs> I, I went to a prep school in New Hampshire where you worked, and uh, but a beautiful, beautiful state. And it was three sports. I was um, it was <clears throat> nine through twelve when I was there. But I was going to ask you about. I thought it might be one through twelve where you were. But when you mentioned a death on campus, um, when I was a young kid. I mean, I was not a silver spooner by any means, but it seemed like everybody got a job when, when you turned 16. It, was, it wasn't even cool if you didn't have a job. And I, I have three people who've done this, um, three tennis players. I said, you know, you'd be better off for the entire summer when you turn 16 to work at McDonald's, mop, mm -hmm. mop floors, do this and do that. But 
one job I had when I was a kid, uh, I worked at a cemetery. My grandfather used to say that uh, I had 10,000 people working underneath me. <laughs> and then, uh, then also, too, is that uh, he, he used to say where I was working, people were dying to get that job or dying dying to be there. But but I, I do remember being at many uh, burials, the graveyard site where when it's a young person, actually death in a lot of ways, a funeral is a celebration of life. I, I think maybe the Irish, mm -hmm. do, Irish do it the best, but, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, when a young person dies, it's completely different. Uh, but coming back to being an athletic director, um, um, and being such a, you know, long time coach, uh, you know, what do you think needs to happen with kids in their early development, the elementary junior high ages to become better athletes? <clears throat> Uh, I think play a lot of different sports and, you know, I think you said it in the question, which is how do you become a better athlete? Be an athlete. And an athlete means being able to do a lot of different things athletically and, and the, the different sports feed off of each other. Um, soccer players can pick up tennis pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, anytime you, and you see a lot of, I mean, what, what's the world game? Soccer is the world game. Tennis is up there. Tennis is probably, I don't know, could be number two as a world game. Um, just all the number of clubs around the world where people play. So um, I think the more sports you play, especially at a young age, gymnastics is an amazing uh, sport to, just to develop body awareness. Um, you know, you mentioned dance earlier. Uh, learning how to move properly. Learning how to move left side, right side, be balanced as an individual. Have, you, have your body be balanced, strength-wise. Um, so there's, you know, there's so many benefits to that. And I, I think there's a guy out of Iowa. I don't know if you know this guy, Steve. Um, we've both been around a while. His name was Don Klott. Uh, I know and, the name, yeah, for sure. Yeah, he coached in Iowa, and he developed, uh, I think Art Andrews was a national champ in the 50s coming out of Iowa. But he's got a book, and it's actually pretty cool. It's a thin book. Um it's the volley method. And Klotz started all his players at the net and then worked their way back to the baseline. So when I got to Iowa, there were all these guys who'd been around, but they were amazing volleyers. And uh, Chuck Darley was one. He went and played number one at Cal Berkeley. And uh, I got to work with him. He was uh, assistant men's coach. Um, but that's kind of a – I almost think that that's such a great way to teach tennis is start at the net because you know you look at where i am now what am i trying to teach I'm trying to get trying to teach the kids how to win win at the net and it's such a foreign concept to most juniors oh and i feel sorry for college coaches uh <laughs> you know they're inheriting a lot of kids have no idea to play how to play doubles mm -hmm. with the volley method uh, i've always asked kids um you, should you be ready for the ball in the air first or off the bounce first? And it's amazing. Almost everybody says off the bounce, but I said, no, it's got to be in the air to go over the net. I love Van, I love Vandermeer's line, uh, the interrelationship of strokes, interrelationship of spins. I mean, if you tell kids, hey, look at look at Djokovic's ready position, most of the time mm -hmm. you see kids because they have an extreme grip, they don't even have the ready position. Mm -hmm. Paul, uh, these are tough numbers. Uh, 3%, less than 3% of uh, kids play college tennis, junior tennis players, and less than 85% of players, give or take, or I should say approximately 85 players, give or take. If they don't make the lineup as a freshman, they don't make the lineup as a um, a sophomore, junior, senior. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you have for parents that are bringing up goal-oriented kids who want to play college tennis? Uh, that's a tricky one. I mean, I it's got to be a fit. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit like my national championship story. The end is not the scholarship or the end is not the admit to, to that college. And I, I, like, I like this expression. As coaches, it's the task of becoming a tennis player. And the task is, you know, any, any task is, usually involves a, 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 some form of difficulty. Um, becoming a tennis player, so often kids are so focused on just hitting balls. They don't play and learning how to play the game. But I think the key word in that, the task of becoming a tennis player, is the becoming part. And becoming is about 
the reality is that you never get there. There's always more to learn. There's always more uh, to do. And, and the, the task never ends. And that's what you want. Those are the kind of kids that you want. That, And those are the kind of programs you want the kids to be in where they're developmental. Where, where they're always, they're, they're not going to be stuck with their tennis. And I see that a lot. Um, you mentioned the player that comes in at number eight in the lineup and never plays. Well, why didn't they develop? Why didn't they become a player that could play in the lineup? And to me, my one of the advantages that I've had, I've never been at the best place. Kenyon College was not Williams and Amherst. So I had to recruit players, and then I had to help develop players. Iowa, we were last in the Big Ten. And Iowa's a flyover state. It's not one of the well-known Big Ten universities in terms of people stop in, people are aware of it, it's a little bit out there. We had to develop players there. Brown, we were last in the big, uh, we were last in the Ivies when I got there. We had to develop players. We weren't going to get first pick. Harvard, Princeton, Yale gets first pick uh, from a recruiting standpoint. And now Denver, Denver's cool. We're mid-major. We're not power five. But I think we've got a product that in some ways is a, a healthier, saner product. And I'm not under – you see a lot of unhappy coaches out there. They're under a lot of pressure. Tennis coaches get fired nowadays. That never used to be the case. And ADs haven't been college coaches. They're administrators. A lot of ADs we've – got, we've got a phenomenal AD here at Denver. A lot of ADs don't understand athletics. All they understand is winning and losing. And a lot of the college coaches in all sports are under a lot of pressure. They will fire you at the drop of a hat. So where does the coach's anxieties go? So they go to the player. And the college coach, you know, they're so focused on winning. And one of the cool things here at Denver, we've had a lot of success in our conference. Um, we can focus on the process. And I think there's probably 10, 12 schools in the whole country that can do that. So we can focus on the process. We've got pretty high odds we're going to go to the NCAA tournament. So we can focus on preparing for the NCAA tournament. We can focus on getting better. Uh, and that's that's kind of a luxury in college sports. Yeah. I know when I was at Iowa, when I was at Brown, every weekend was do or die. If we don't win these two matches, we're not going to the NCAA tournament. Yeah, you know, a couple of things, just to backtrack out. I like how you say the task of becoming a tennis player, you never get there. Jim Lair has a great line, tennis players never arrive, they're always in transit to a better place. Mm -hmm. um, but with D1, I tell, you know, and I've been in the, the circle of uh, working with junior tennis players with goals and training tennis teachers and tennis coaches. Um, I say many times, and this is not um, a, a shot at D1 coaches, but they, they're spending three hours running practice and then they spend four hours on the phone trying to find people who could beat the people that are in practice. Yeah. So, you know, then I think also too, a lot of times at D1 coaches, I don't really like it where, you know, my father used to use the word, uh, don't be a prima donna, but I think sometimes the coaches are making the players a prima donna saying, hey, you don't have to come till January. Hey, when you get here, we'll take you to pro mm -hmm. events. And um, it's kind of a pipe dream and they're overselling. Um, but yeah, I think that just what you can't said earlier, that you're in the relationship business and what a, what a vehicle for mm -hmm. people to grow through college tennis. Well, you know, you have that, and then you'll have a lot of college coaches that will not work on technique. And it's like, well, how do you develop as a player if you're not going to work on technique? And it's more about volume. And obviously, if you get a world-class player as a freshman, it's probably less technique that you need to, to, to work on so that recruiting can be important there. But for most of us, you know, if we're not getting first pick, we're having to develop players. And you've got to be willing to, uh, you know, you've got to be willing to work on technique. But also, I think 
that's what's so cool about like a Stefanski approach, where if you focus on posture balance, on movement, that cleans up a lot of the technique. Yeah, and it's, and, uh, it's like Lee Trevino on golf said, you know, you, uh, <clears throat> how's it, how do you say it? Um, if a plumber comes to your house and you have a leaky faucet, you don't have to take the roof off the house. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Let me ask you, your AD, yeah, is, is that Josh Burlow? Yes, Josh Burlow. He's uh, in his second year here. And he, <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Uh, he is transforming this place. Uh, and it, it's amazing what he's done already just from a facility standpoint but also his vision and he gets it he gets he understands what we need uh, he understands the need to have a buy-in across campus with the uh with the administration and he also sees what we have as a product and denver is is such a unique place and uh, obviously you're in the denver market you've got a lot of competition with pro sports but We've got a great product, and you look at the teams. We've had national championships in men's lacrosse. Women's lacrosse was undefeated until the national semifinals. They lost to Northwestern. Uh, our men's soccer have been quarterfinalists. Women's soccer is nationally ranked. Um, our tennis teams have been nationally ranked. So we've, there's, it's such a cool environment because – and we didn't mention hockey. We were winning national championships, NHL players. So you've got all these athletes that are kind of like a, like a big family. And I think that's pretty unique. We don't have too many sports, but the sports that we have are all, all, all high national level uh, programs. It's interesting you don't so it's have, a, it's you, a really that you don't have cool football. Environment. That you don't have football. Yes, no football. And, and probably our emerging sport will be basketball. I think that's the, the sport that uh, I know that Josh Burlow um, – that's the sport he's pushing. We brought in uh, the assistant coach from Stanford, and he's building the program. So uh, that will be kind of the next emerging sport on campus. No, I, I, I read I, I read online Josh, Josh Burlow. He certainly uh, – he's earned his stripes. He's paid his dues. I mean, it's very interesting to see or read about someone's background. How do you go from one position to the next? But I, He started I, off as ticket, ticket manager at Notre Dame. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, you know, I think that's one of the, some ways of, yeah. sorry to interrupt, the rags to riches story. I mean, where mm -hmm. um, it's like with, uh, you know, I have a brother-in-law who doesn't tell anybody he has a Harvard MBA, but he tells everybody he went to Michigan. And <laughs> my, my mother used to tell this story about him that when he started working for UPS, um, you know, he wasn't hired coming out of the Harvard or whatever, but he had to drive a truck. Um, yeah, you got to get your hands dirty and. I think that's, just, mm -hmm. you know, uh, wash some dishes. Um, did, yeah, I think that's a problem with young junior tennis players today. They don't get their hands dirty. They, they don't start at the bottom and work their way up. And, and find those hidden jewels, too. I mean, I think Josh Burlow, to his credit, he saw the potential in Denver. And um, he, he's got one of the hidden jewels to, to be an AD at. And hopefully, hopefully he'll stay long enough to, you know, to, to really max that possibility. But when, when I looked up the AD, I thought maybe Ron Graham was still there <laughs> with uh, Jeremy Wurtzman, who was a student of mine. Mm -hmm. He yep. he was a coach at Denver at one point, and uh, but yeah, Ron Graham uh, played at Denver. He played in the NHL. His son has got his name on the Stanley Cup. His wife became an administrator. She has her name on the Stanley Cup. Only mother and son to be on the Stanley Cup, but. Uh, <laughs> Actually, Murray Armstrong, uh, that's a name everybody used to say back east. Was Ned Harkness, who was at Cornell, he won a national championships in hockey and, and uh, lacrosse at both RPI and Cornell. Pretty, hmm. pretty impressive. But uh, Murray Armstrong was at Denver. Uh, he won five NCAA championships. And in 1960, they were in the finals and lost three times. But he, his name was always wow. brought up. But he was at Denver forever and... 1960 when the u.s team but they did win in 1980 everybody knows that but they also won the gold medal in 1960 denver uh played that gold medal winning team twice it was they they tied them once and beat them once and then the russians 
1960, University of Denver played the Russians and tied them. So something special was going on. I know they're really good now, but they were they were the the go to team uh, back in the day, Denver mm-hmm. hockey. Denver, you know, uh, Montgomery, who coaches the Bruins, was a coach. Yeah, of Denver. yeah. And uh, I mean, they, so I think in all our sports, uh, Bill Tierney left Princeton to come to Denver to be the lacrosse coach, and he had won seven national titles at Princeton, wins the national title uh, at Denver, and been in a bunch of Final Fours here at Denver. Uh, on the women's side, for college coaches, you know, we had. Wurtzman, you mentioned, uh, Amy Jensen, who won two national titles and doubles at Cal, was coaching here. Uh, Christian Bass um, was the was the woman that coached before I came here. She won national doubles titles with her sister at Notre Dame. Uh, they've had a lot of good coaches. My assistant was a BU grad, 2017 Maureen Slattery. Uh, she won. Uh, she was an All American uh, at Denver. So they've got a lot of good coaches here that uh, they come to Denver, but what's really cool is they stay at Denver. And I think a lot of it is just the quality of living here. Uh, it's a great community to raise family and, uh, and you have the weather. No, it's I've been, I've been to facility. Denver tonight enough to just um, <laughs> think I could only think of one negative. And let me ask you about this is uh high altitude tennis. I guess maybe it's a good thing. Jimmy Connors, they had a tournament, a pro tournament, a tournament in Denver and, it's like he never lost that tournament. You could take the ball on the rise mm-hmm. and the way he played. But um, obviously, it's it's what the Mile High City. What, what do you think about high altitude mm-hmm. tennis? Uh, I don't. I think it's more overblown than 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 not. I think I think it's more's made made a big. We play with high altitude balls, so the ball will stimulate low altitude tennis. Um, it carries a little bit, but we're probably talking a couple of inches. Um, so I think the kind of you get used to it after probably two, three days. And uh, conditioning-wise, when we when we go down to sea level, uh, we can play all day um, because we're we're training at altitude. But I, I don't think it hurts us. Well, actually, too, when you when you when you go down, it probably. Is- <clears throat> It's it's better to go from fast to slow than slow to fast, right? So the, the visiting exactly. teams have a little time. Do they have a tough time adjusting? Uh, yeah, I, I think they do. In fact, we'll have some teams that say, "Oh, we're not gonna we're not gonna come to Denver to play you, but you're welcome to come play us here." But um, no, it's I, I think it's overblown. Um, we've got some teams that come in here, and uh, we had Wisconsin come in here two years ago. Their flight was late; they didn't get to practice. They hit early in the morning. We played and uh, had a good match, and they ended up beating us. I think it was like 5 2, 4 3. And, you know, a lot of it is how you sell it. Their coach, who coached at New Mexico, just told the kids, hey, you'll, you'll figure it out and warm up. It's not that big a deal. Hit a little more spin, and uh, you're good to go. And, and they did. So I, I think part of it is just, I think a lot of coaches make a, a big deal out of it. Yeah. Players, and then I guess if the players, uh, if the coach doesn't uh, step up and go, hey, you know, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Hey, Paul, but, it's been uh, great to yeah. have you online um, with our listeners. Um, yeah, go to uh, Wardlaw Directions. I'll follow up and talk to you about the book Pressure Tennis. Um, mm-hmm. The uh, You've shared so many uh valuable points um with uh i guess here's a question and being on the negative side hockey players um i grew up my father was a civil engineer but he coached as a hobby and um i get people's attention i said well one of my brothers was a gm of three nhl hockey teams but uh just you know i grew up 10 miles from the canadian border what they would say about a Bad hockey coaches, uh, he just opens the gate, you know, where the players, they platoon, and someone's got to open the gate where they every 45 seconds change. But the bad tennis coach, um, you know, he's, he's just the bus driver where uh, there's um, – I was talking to a young coach I trained. And fortunately, I think now, this, this is not leading in my question, but, I mean, tennis coaches years ago used to drive the bus, and it's just – are you still doing that? Uh, less so. Um, because 
where we're located, there's only a few schools for us to play. Oh, I see. Um, but we drove down to Air Force last week, and then uh, we'll drive to CU, we'll drive to CSU. But a lot of times they'll come and play us here because we have a nice facility. Um, but no, we're not driving much. And, uh, no, because you coaches in, coaches in the hot sun all day, and then the drive back and forth. Do you have your own indoor courts, or do you use a club? Oh, no, no. We, we have a place, uh, a partnership with uh, Denver, uh, City of Denver, and then Denver Public Schools. It's called the Denver Tennis Park. And, uh, seven indoor, six outdoor, beautiful setup, brand new, four years old. Um, so we've got a, it's a great, great training. And it's right on the corner, northwest corner of our campus. So our kids leave the dorms and they walk five minutes and they're right at the tennis park. Um, so it's, uh, it's super convenient, really, really nice setup. You know, I, I think what, what's funny is that as I, you know, head off into the, to the sunset as a college coach, it could be, you know, whatever, five and 10 years from now. Um, this is probably the best place I've worked, which is, which is kind of ironic. Uh, I've worked in some good places and it's just kind of a nice balance between Brown and Iowa, where you've got the, you know, big state school, small Ivy, and uh, I think there's a lot of advantages to what we have here with the, the private education, private school education, but also uh, full scholarships and then a great training center. So it's, uh, well, it's a you, lot of fun. Yeah, you love what you do, so you can, you, you certainly uh, knock on wood have a lot more years to uh, to coach. <laughs> exactly. But the, the drive the bus, I mean, as a, the triangle, that's my last question to end on. Appreciate all your time. The, you got the parent or parents, you got the player, and then you got the coach. Um, there's so much to it. Uh, it's not really fair to say, well, if the hockey coach just opens the gate and the, um, the tennis coach, so sometimes all they, all they don't do anything but drive the bus. But, mm -hmm. um, the connection between those three, the player, the coach, the the parent, what what do you think has to come together? Maybe just a few points to really have that yeah. click. Well, I you know, I think if uh if you've ever done the USTA high performance training, that that's actually one of the first questions they ask. They they have the triangle and they say, Well, who should be driving the bus and that and, and, and that those three relationships. And I think the answer has to be the parent. It's their child. Um, and then the art of the deal as the coach is to be able to work with the, the child and the parent. And you know, you, at the end of the day, they're gonna they're gonna move on to the to the next coach if, if they're not happy with the way things are. But I mean, I think that's fair. <clears throat> as you get into high school, I think. A lot of high school programs, they do challenge matches early in the year to, to determine a, a lineup so it's objective. That way they don't have to hear from the parents. And then in the, uh, as they progress to the college scene, a lot of college coaches won't even talk to parents. Um, I'm not like that. I'm happy to talk to the parents. And, uh, you know, most of our parents are pretty non intrusive. So, we don't really get into discussions about lineup or this, that, or the other. And the times that parents do call, it's more of a, a helpful uh, tip just to say, hey, here's where my daughter is, or here's how she's feeling. And it's just kind of good to know those things. But, um, but I think I think the parents, ultimately, they're driving the bus and should. It is their child. Now, the, the problem you have is, are they educated in making the right decision? And if it's the first time they've been through it, probably not. And that's probably the art of the art of the coach uh, trying to educate them as best as possible in a in a productive way. Uh, yeah, a lot of variables. No, for sure, that's a great answer. Um, no, I agree with you. The parent, um, they're they're the one should, that should be driving the bus. I I really think. You know, certainly it's got to be handled the right way, but the parents much better off to be proactive, mm -hmm. um, meaning that they're 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 involved. I mean, I do I like the term you know conscientious neglect. They um, they 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 know what's going on, but uh, they're they don't have to be climbing the fence necessarily. But uh, I think with a coach, 
I think a good definition when you think about driving the bus is they should be the compass. Mm -hmm. We're giving the directions and, you know, this is, and, you know, the parent needs to make sure that the kid's following the directions. But I think also too, with the kid, they shouldn't just be on the bus looking out the window. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they shouldn't be in the high chair where they're just being spoon fed. They, they need to, we always share a Bradenism, uh, become an independent thinker and a problem solver. Mm -hmm. But that this has sense. certainly been one of my favorite podcasts. Yeah. I mean, you know, this actually is like a, to me, it's like a college course to go back and there's just so many golden nuggets that, um, and then someone like yourself, I mean, young coaches, uh, like, I like what you said, you just ask questions, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I do think that that's one of the problems, it, not so much in what you do as a college coach, you know, you have to be highly educated just to sit at the table and be interviewed, or you have to have jumped through all the hoops and hurdles to have the, the specific degrees and such. But I think it, it's in, in the private sector, it's too easy just kind of hang up your shingle, especially the, the parent who doesn't, like you said, that they don't really know the, the, the sparring partner becomes uh, glorified. Like they actually know what they're mm -hmm. talking about. They're just a sparring partner. But um, no, you, you shared so many uh, invaluable points with us, but I really appreciate you being a guest on our podcast. Yeah, it's always fun. And, and Good to good to hear from you too, Steve. I mean, the '90s seemed like it wasn't that far away. Yeah, no, exactly. Met. It doesn't. It seems like <laughs> it was yesterday. Um, but no, I um, I hear your name on a regular basis because uh, you know I, I I said parents and and uh, I just hear parents tell other parents you go go look at Ward Law Directionals, and I know obviously. Um, you know, it's much more than just directionals, but, uh, and surely mm -hmm. you shared that with us today. I really appreciate it. We'll yeah, have to do well, it again. Always, I'd love to get a, a I'd, yeah. love to, I'd love to get a panel. I mean, we've talked about doing these podcasts different ways. Um, I didn't really know what I was getting into. Uh, Andy Fitzell, I worked with, uh, we started a podcast and, um, uh, you know, he's married to a German gal and, uh, they went back to Germany and I said, well, these podcasts, uh, do I just do, you know, one a month or every other week and he said no you got to do it weekly but uh wow. um getting a guest like yourself makes it a pure pleasure to do it yeah we used to do uh think tanks at iowa so we would get a group of coaches together and uh, had some really interesting guests so uh, yeah and and it's fun it's it's fun to be a learner and um in fact you can, if you've got teaching pros listening we you know, you do drills, you go up the river, down the river. Yeah. You know, winners move this way. And we go, we, we, it's, we call them winners and learners. So winners move up, learners move down. So yeah. There you go. Just take a few more minutes of up, down. It, it's, it's very interesting. I'd say the only time that anyone's ever asked me about the wind or the sun when you're doing up and down is a senior player. The juniors, <laughs> I mean, you touched on so many things, the anxiety, they move up. And well, I, if I was playing, I'd want to move up too. So, but I, if I move up, I want to know where the sun is and which way the wind's blowing. But the, the juniors don't even stop and think about that. It's, it's really, you know, I could talk to you all day with, um, you know, what we used to do is uh, uh, put the very, uh, you know, I, I was in Tampa for 15 years. It plays at 28 courts. And, and in, in Florida, most of the seniors, they don't want to play on, um, clay courts. So we had all these hard courts. We had 16 hard courts and, you know, we put the younger players at the very top. So they got a chance to play all the older players. And then as they would lose and we just feed them into technical courts. Um, but I, I do think that the, that's a um, podcast in itself, all the different ways to do up and down. Mm -hmm. You know, I know Jim Lair used to do it where people would move up and down based on how they handled themselves mentally you know, the serve ritual, the return ritual. And, you know, he would just blow the whistle. And, um, but with this, just to take a few more minutes. Um, sure, please. With, with the podcast, I should say with uh, your course online, could you just um, take another minute and talk about, I love how you yell out the drills where, you know, they just have to know whether it's an inside ball, outside ball. Could you comment on a couple of drills that you do for directionals? Uh, yeah, here's an example. And these are, these are, fresh examples because this happened yesterday so we did mini tennis uh, started the day and it had to be all slice and we just did uh, on two courts eight players the court that they would play on was half a doubles court 
So you had the service box, you know, into the service box. And we did directional. So we did uh, outside forehands, slice to slice, outside backhand, slice to slice. One player then would feed inside balls, slice, and they would just, one player just kept feeding an inside ball and move and cover. Then we did uh, one player would feed uh, outside balls, and then the player would slice a 90 degree change of direction. And uh, when you do all of those, each player gets to do them. That takes a total of six minutes. And what it does is it, one, you work on your slice, you work on your mini tennis, but you also tactically just reinforce them seeing those different situations um, and just kind of reinforcing. Um, so, so that could be an example. Um, we do a lot of, um, like if we're doing directionals, we'll do from the baseline, we'll go, uh, I will hit two cross. And on my third cross, you'll go 90 degrees. And then I'll run over and I'll hit two cross. And then on the third one, you'll go 90 degrees. And then we'll switch rolls. We'll go, I'll hit you two cross. And my third ball, I'll hit, give you an inside ball. You'll change direction. And then we'll go two cross. And then I'll give you a, an inside ball. You'll change direction. So we do a lot of, just a lot of, they're purposeful. Uh, you're probably playing at 80, 85% pace, but it's um, just seeing, seeing those patterns, seeing those situations. As I mentioned earlier, the inside ball is probably the ball that most programs uh, don't spend much time on. And it's probably your first opportunity to open the court. I, li I like it. I like it where you have them just call out what the shot is too. So they are just, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, plus yep. there's well, always, that's, a, that's the way to, yeah, that's the way for that for me to understand whether they know what they're doing. Yeah, and they're breathing out when they yell it out. Mm -hmm. They're, uh, mm -hmm. but I think also too is that there's just so many pearls, golden nuggets. Uh, yeah, you said it that most of the years when that ball. I like the phrase from your uh, contribution to tennis direction was if the ball goes across your body, and you're you're going to take that down the line. Uh, you know, that's the tennis math. I mean, it's going to be a little bit tough mm -hmm. to calculate and a lot of times it's going to be an unforced error, mm -hmm. especially if you're playing up and down and you don't know there's a crosswind <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's good. But Paul, thank you so right. much for your time. We'll have to do this again. I'd like to, we're talking about, uh, um, sounds like you're, uh, certainly, uh, not somebody who spent a lot of time watching the Brady bunch, but Andy Fitzsell started our podcast. So we, we talked about doing the Brady Bunch style and, and anybody who watched that oh, yeah. sitcom from hundred years ago, the characters, there'd be like, I don't know, six, like head, six headshots yeah. in a zoom. And, uh, mm -hmm. but, um, we, yeah, we've talked about taking one topic and getting some people on and with your background and, uh, being so deep into the tennis education, it'd be fun to have you be part of that when we get around yeah. to doing that. Yeah. Always happy to, to join. So uh, just say the word. Yeah, so, tennis education. Yeah. I think that's the solution for all oh, American tennis. All of tennis is education, education, education. Mm -hmm. but, well, uh, and Steve, I mean, obviously you guys are uh, kind of at the forefront, so it's pretty cool what you're doing in these podcasts. And, and people don't realize the amount of time it takes to put these together. Yeah. And, uh, and to organize. And so uh, kudos to you guys and your crew. To, well, thanks. Uh, I think, what you know, doing. the the one thing that um, – you know, a lot of times people refer to uh, myself in third person. Well, the great base is Steve Smith stuff. And it's, a, that's as far away from the truth as anyone could think. It's just, it's, we're carrying the torch for ten, many tennis teachers that have gone before us and that there's so many things that should not be forgotten. And uh, I mean, obviously I, I was wrong. I think I put maybe another eight years on your life. I didn't know you had coached college tennis that long. So I apologize <laughs> about that. This is, I want to say this is my 36 year as a college coach. Wow. You're yeah, right, you're as right, a head coach. You're right, you're right up there and, with Dave Fish. Yeah. And, and what you're supposed to say, Steve, though, is did you start when you were 12? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. You go. So that's that often the blow a little bit. Yeah. I think you and I probably uh, go to the same barber. Yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we can't hide it. But, uh, but Paul, no, thanks a lot. This has been fantastic. All right. We'll have to Steve, do it all again. the best. And, uh, yeah, let, we'll, let's, let's stay in touch. Okay, thanks. All right, take care. Good night. Good morning, good afternoon. That was fantastic. Listeners, thanks for listening.
Paul Wardlaw. That was uh, certainly one of my favorite podcasts. I could tell you that right away. Um, so many golden nuggets. Um, obviously, a lifelong learner, intellectual, tennis intellectual. Uh, people start referring to book after book and coach after coach. And um, anyway, thanks, Paul Wardlaw. Thanks, listeners, for the Betterment of Tennis. Great Base Tennis Podcast, signing off.